Good evening. We'll call our town meeting for the regular town council meeting for November 12th, 2024, to occur at 6 p.m. Tonight, we're going to be joined by Scout uh, Ethan Tejar. Uh, <laughs> 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 Nancy Guardo, one. Um, if you'll just come up, you want to set the podium up, provide your name and address. Uh, so we we'll can we wait till the like investment project? Please? You can refer to the like, best project if you like. Yeah, just all of them every day. Bill, are you the same, sir? Yeah. Okay, I, thought I, thought were, I thought that we were signed up for. Not a, not a problem at all. Jane Lance. The same. Same. Mr. Pierre, Sean. John Spears, four to six four sir. Thanks for having me up here. I'm only having a long three minutes. We've been kind of going back and forth to the church gate in the back. And the gate is open every day. Anybody opens it, it's not a lot. I'm close to the microphone here. I, I've, I've lived there for 26 years um, and lived in one year 62 years. But the deal is that the gate is always open. And I've closed that gate 100 times or more. I don't know when I first. I know I mentioned to you first, Mr. Mayor, that's been at least eight months ago. Please keep that gate closed. And, we would prefer it to be closed. And then I see these emails coming out where, oh no, we're going to take the gate down. We don't need that gate anymore. So, and we were almost to that point where Dorothy kind of spoke in all of a sudden and said, oh, but the residents would prefer not to have that gate open at any time. So, my understanding is the gate should be closed except for on Sundays during services. Um, during this email encounter, I think it was Troy Smith. Um, Troy Smith said that um, he, he doesn't think anybody goes out of that gate. Then they should have it open all the time. Maybe they would move the gate. So that's when it kind of upset me a little bit because today they open the gate. At least 100 cars before noon went out that gate or in that gate. So if nobody uses that gate, that's not true. I prefer it to be closed all the time. Not even, I think now that the church has gotten so big, maybe they don't even open on Sunday. We don't need that traffic in our residential area. We prefer not to have it. Uh, at least I would prefer not to have it. And I think there's some other people that need to talk on this as well. Um, appreciate you listening. Any questions? John, how many? So you said 100 cars in this morning? Yeah, just this morning, five of those things. There's a huge group that is there that we're in the department of funding that science. The guy that got probably 200, 300 people to show Tuesdays, Tuesdays Wednesdays, and Sundays, I suspect. Yeah, it's not a church function. Yeah. You'll get your opportunity when you're at a microphone yeah. because otherwise we can't get on the records. Um, John, so those are the, because there's a, 
Robert, there's some type of agreement that we had with the church based on long before any of us were here. Yeah, that street was closed. Yeah, it's off the privacy. We need to see what was approved and what was not approved, and what the intent was during that council meeting when it was approved to see what that gate was for and what if any agreements have been made subsequent to when they were approved. Um, I'm also going to be setting up a meeting with uh, Mr. Spears, myself, and then representatives of the uh, church. So let's try to figure out you know, what's going on, how to cure it, and go from there. How's the parking account? Is that improved? The parking on the street? Up and down the street? On forest. Well, this last Sunday, I'm not sure, maybe the parking lot might have been for Veterans Day or something, but it was part of it all down the street on Sunday morning as well. Um, I think they got bring your spot a little bit. Um, and I'd like to keep them on their side of the road. Yeah, we'll take a look and, like I said, we'll. You'll meet with us. We appreciate that you can represent. And I will. Okay. I think that any of the other people that want to meet could be invited as well. Because, like I say, I'm speaking for myself. I don't want to put this together and say we're going to take a pack of town council or anything. We just we are tired of the traffic, and during the week, it's really bad. Saturday, Sundays. I mean, come on, Sunday. I'm surprised anybody can get through there right now. It's so soft there. <laughs> You'd be surprised if the vehicles that make it up and down that hill on a day to day. I had to dig out four of them, you know, in the last month. It's my house. <laughs> well, that, that didn't even count. I'm just talking about in front of my house. But yeah, it's, it's interesting how uh, our, 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 the, the water flow coming from downtown when we didn't build any retention ponds for the, for the parking lot, we just let everything go down the street and out. And, and, and I, I can tell you a little bit, my neighbor behind me, LaRue, her yard is flooded after the storm. Of any type, the storm. And we know what happened to the rest of the Yeah, um, well, yeah, we, or, or collected somewhere. Um, I don't know. Well, let's fix one problem at a time. Well, well yeah, I, we'll work like say, I'm we'll trying to stay on point with the one thing right now. I guess the gate be flooded. Sounds good. And I know there'll be some other people that have to share as well. Thank, Thank you, you very John. much. Appreciate you, sir. Have a nice night. It's the end of it. Stacked up tonight. Good to see y'all. Good to see you. Position over here. All right. Liz Hammond, 60 Oak Hill Street in the town of Wintermere. And I prepared remarks so that I don't mess up any of my numbers here. So, as the parent of two rowers and a supporter of all rowers at Orlando Area Rowing Society, ORS, I'm here to advocate for a safer crosswalk between the parking lot of Wintermere Elementary and the ORS Gold House on the OUC McGuire Road property. ORS coaches and parents work very hard to raise healthy, respectful, and mindful athletes. These kids and their coaches are dedicated and have attracted a large growing program. Although our rowers are mostly aware when they make a crossing from the parking lot to the boathouse, safety remains a concern given the number of kids and the times when they use that crossing. Currently, we have 145 high schoolers who practice from 4 to 6.30 p.m. every weekday and from 7.30 to 10.30 on Saturdays. Additionally, we have an average of 35 middle schoolers practicing each weekday and also on Saturdays. That all makes for a lot of crossing at some very busy times. Those are all around rush hour, as you can imagine. And now those crossings are happening in the dark at the end of weekday practices. So a lot of the ORS parents and the coaches have been asking for a beacon at that, like our crosswalk beacons. Um, I know that the town has recently installed a new beacon at the crosswalk of 10th and Main, and as the runner that often uses that crossing, thank you all for that. I appreciate that. Um, I know the beacons are not inexpensive and that the town has a project list that has competing priorities. So funds for another beacon for the Oars Crosswalk might be far off. However, I'm asking tonight if a funding source is available, please prioritize a beacon for that McGuire Park roundabout. It probably receives more pedestrian traffic than just about any other location in town. And as I just stated those numbers on a daily basis, they have practice every single day, except for Sunday. Um, 
I also noticed with that new beacon that was just installed on 10th and Main, there's another crosswalk signal that's half a block up from it. Maybe that could be relocated over to, you know, as a temporary solution for a new beacon to purchase. That would be great. Anything to assist would be really helpful. We do have parents that sit out there and help, and they wear little vests and everything, and they try to conduct it. But as a driver, I'm aware of that traffic, and I, every once in a while, the most kid, I feel like, and they're, you know, those kids are mindful, but they still need some assistance. So um, I know that a lot of those kids would like to be here right now. They're doing some sort of hellish thing called a 6K or test as I speak, so they can't make it tonight, but they all thank you too. Any questions? I can answer. I do have a question because I live right there and I think that all the time. Yeah. Almost one either day because the parent was standing, he wasn't even in across the block area. He was just standing in the grass by the best. And um but would a light help, especially this time? Well, because there's no light there, it's very dark. Yeah, I think anything could assist, you know. I mean ideally it would be something with flashing that they can press and there is one, like I said, that might be able to be located. I don't know what. No, that, that one's that's antiquated. That's it's coming down. That's why I almost got hit one day because I thought it was flashing and no one was saying attention. <laughs> but anyway, so yes, anything would assist. You know, I mean, I would love, I know that there are some other areas under consideration for some of those installations of the beacon lights that we've seen. Um, if we could get bumped up, like I said, those numbers, I've got to think that that's got to be one of the busiest. That's great. And you they probably do. I think one of the things that so we made sure that we put four lights in that roundabout so it made us as well lit as possible. Now we'll 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 so let's start with yeah, one this Yeah, I am. I am. That's a lot of standing problems. So it required two. We went ahead and put four in. Obviously, it was forever at the mercy of the electric. So fix this for us uh, because they're direct connect. Um, does Forbes have any funds that they would be willing to match the town funds to do something? Yeah, um, because so maybe do some kind of a capital drive or something, you know, like with, with the parents or whatever. But um, here it's a small organization, and our coaches are, you know, kind of honestly, the coaches, the coaching staff has to have multiple jobs to be able to afford things. We just don't have the budget for it. Issue, the issue becomes, you know, that program has grown exponentially yeah. with the same footprint. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, traffic has grown exponentially with the same footprint. Um, Robert, I, mean, I think it's not as simple as just putting up a crosswalk at the year next to study our yeah, we can include that in the golf cart assessment as well to take a look at where the crossings are and where uh, pedestrian crossings will add as well. So we can take a look at that. Yeah, I mean, I'd be saying, please, could you talk to them and talk about maybe some sort of capital drive? I mean, I know that they're limited on funds and stuff, but I also know those folks are forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. You know, so it's not a cheap school year. So, and you guys got 300 kids in there now, counting the middle schoolers? Oh, and then it's probably like 200, but yeah. Okay. And then the master's so, part of it. It's, it's a big ticket, too. So I think, you know, an idea of maybe a little a little uh, contribution on both sides to go a long ways. Maybe try to make this happen. Absolutely. Maybe we'll hold some kind of event okay. But anyway, yeah, yes, I understand. I'll, I'll bring that message back, but I appreciate Let's work it. together on a solution. And if LRP would consider it in their prioritization, um, Councilman Gavin, are you? I was just going to I was to make the prior cut. I'm not on LRP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, if there is a prioritization list for those locations, if a study could be done to assess the actual usage and the pedestrian flow on there, I think that, you know, like I said, I, I, I truly believe that I, I'm all over these streets all the time running. I think most of everyone can see me. Um, so I, I feel like I have a good sense of where pedestrian crossings are being used. Well, yeah. So it's, it's that knowledge and local knowledge. Plus, if we're able to combine that particular study with an additional study that we're going to say quite a bit. Those studies do be certain for they're not any expense. They cost about as much as the as the like apparatus. Yeah. So it's not a forty thousand dollar situation uh, to solve. 
Okay. What is the cost of the lights? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, Twenty-four to twenty-eight thousand these days. On the yes, yes, and what? But that's for a standard crosswalk. We have to remember this is at a roundabout, so there may be different apparatus necessary for this. Because you have to see different angles. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to study it out. It's part of making sure we do it correctly. Sound, otherwise we end up putting the town in additional liability. More so than if you had done nothing. So it's a shame, but that's the way it works. So we gotta make sure we check all the boxes properly. They will be pleased to have some knowledge on this. Okay. Yeah. I, I appreciate you and thank you. We're happy to talk with them too as well, but definitely if we can work on something together, let's see. I'll bring that back to you. That'd be fantastic for me. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for all your work on the ways to do as well. And talking about I don't know if you understand the Yes, I've actually reached out to them three or four times, and they got back to me last week to say they were going to look into what the schedule was to get that down light repaired and moved. Because it's just laying there. Yeah. Yeah, this is a very good. Yeah, it's not a very good one, too. I'll reach out to the rep, too. It's a great relationship. Probably then two or three months, but not do it. Yeah. Ms. Sue Ellen. Hi, everybody. My name is Sue Ellen Doty. I've lived here for 34 years, 328 Forest Street. The gate of the church kind of like backs up. It's a tiny bit off to my right. And I've lived here all these years, and I came after the deal with this day with the cool church and, and uh, you know, allowing church to close boards and, and the deals that were made with Coco, I guess, because we, I, I think the people there were very worried about the traffic. That's why we did put that game out, and they made that deal about Sunday, and I think it was Wednesday night when they used to have supper. But then you're going to have a meeting and you're going to look at the records about what was discussed then. But you really have to apply it to a town, like you said, that's grown quite a bit. You didn't have King's Point when they made that deal. And just, I had dogs, I had cats, I had a small child that grew up here. And that street has always been. Kind of scary, but we had a really nice speed. You know, it was 15 miles an hour. And um, gosh, there's just a little incident. Uh, what was it, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, Olympia High School had their homecoming foot. <clears throat> and all of the traffic was diverted uh, for us. But there wasn't a policeman there, they were all on main, and they were flying down our road, flying. And my husband went out, he was doing yard work, he said, like this, very nice. And this woman gave him the finger and sped up. Okay, now a lot of people speed up when you ask them to slow down. So he called it a police officer. I think it was about 40 minutes later, the police officer came and my husband explained the situation. And the police officer looked him in the eye and said, that woman was, um, to uh, move them to free, that's what free speech. She was, that was a free speech. We knew that. And that, so for me, living on that street that this complaint is about, and possibly if you do call to get back up somehow, and the police officer tells you that the person that was speeding and breaking the law was operating for free speech, that makes me even more nervous. About one individual and one small community deciding the fate of a lot of us that have been on force for a long time and raised our families there. And we're worried about our city. People, are, this town has grown so much in the 34 years that I've lived here. And the church has this great layoff. You come in and do 
let your kids out. There's like this round thing. Isn't it interesting on your call time? And there's this round thing, and then you go out. There's no need to go out. There's no need. But there is a need for us to be safeguarded by our community. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I agree with everything you're saying about that. I go to that church regularly. One of the time I miss, I should probably say, I will take this message personally to leadership there. God, he's done the same rules. I would not want it if it was, I go to that church, I would not want that to own my house. So based on that, that's what my philosophy in every decision I've ever faced, my, uh, any opinion I have on, I will personally go and talk to the in, in hopes that it reaches kids and doesn't have to be some sort of contractual old you know, contract. Just, just hey, common sense, if people don't want it. It's community, it's the church. You, you can go out that way, there's plenty of ways in and out. So I'll do my best to hear the message. Starting tonight. We work with staff too because we want to make sure that we. I will sit here with the negotiations to close that room all hammered out. John probably less. I know a lot of you were. Um, but let's just get those details to go together. Um, I think we can make a better case yeah. that way all, all together. I know also that you have a lot of good things there. Well, I would say anything, but I just, I just think that it's sometimes things can be handled quicker and more effectively and formally, you know, if we did that, you know, a little bit more of the no need to kind of thing. We've gone to the yeah, I, I see it's, it's not a reasonable request at all. It's not a reasonable at all. We've gone to the church. Right. <clears throat> They're all the same. So, and I can't promise anything, but I'll just say I 100% agree. You're, you're on it. <laughs> you're, you're in now. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'll still play on Sundays now on if they don't do it. You already do. Thanks, Abby. God, I'm going to be going to make Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was doing. It was the drums. <laughs> but I, I agree with all of you. And the fact that I wouldn't want that part of my house was my favorite church. So I do my best. Thank you, sir. Uh, Renee Singon. Chingolani. Chingolani. Say, say it again for me. Chingolani. Chingolani. Yes. Um, my father was living on Forest Street, and we still live at Fort Forest Street. When the church, and he was a deacon at the church, when they wanted to close the road and make the gymnasium and education building. I spoke with the senior pastor, who was the pastor at that time. He said the town was very concerned about the traffic in the neighborhood. And that, he said, I don't believe it was written con contractually, but informally, we agreed, us the church, for the town, that we would keep the gate closed, Sunday and Wednesday being the exception. I had this conversation with Troy Schmidt about a year and a half ago, maybe two years. I called Brad Cornelius. Brad Cornelius had no idea what's going on. And then I hear that Troy has come to Robert Smith and asked to take the gate down. And you said, it's on private property. You can do whatever you would like to do. And I went today, I called and left a message for Troy Schmidt. He did not respond. I went to the church and I spoke to the senior pastor, Chuck Carter. And I said, I don't understand why Troy would have written this letter when he knew that it was an issue. He just wants the gate gone. Now, if the town was concerned then with traffic entering the neighborhood, I would think they would be interested now in keeping that traffic away from the neighborhood. I don't know about you, but I think we have more traffic in our neighborhood. And we have consistently gotten more traffic in our neighborhood. You fix that end of the street or that in the town on Oakdale so they can't go tracing through their neighborhood anymore. But Forest Street is now Main Street West. 
and they come and they fly, and they're rude. So, there was an agreement. You weren't here. Troy Schmidt knew because I had called, and I've also called Brad Cornelius. This is not very Christian of them. And when I spoke to the senior pastor today, I said, Troy knew that we didn't want that gate removed, and he bypassed us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll let you know how we all do. Oh. Up it is. I need a under new business item one. This is a resolution 2024 08. The Windermere Trail Project. Town of Windermere State the Roots and Tools Project, Phase One. Uh, presenting tonight will be my own Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I'm grab my pen, sorry. Just making sure. We've got some uh, paper here just in case. Uh, hello, Michael with Kimmy Horn. Um, I've been involved with this project for some time now. Um, this is kind of a moment of celebration for us because it's time to sign an agreement with the uh, Florida Department of Transportation to receive funds. And that's what this action about it is uh, requested of town council for tonight. Um, it's been a long time coming. And we have, we've spent quite a bit of time. Uh, uh, we, we've done several field visits. We did the design and wrapped it up in pretty much 2022. But because some of the funds were received from the state, and prior to that, these funds were received from the federal government. Um, we've had to uh, do quite a bit of additional studies. We've had to uh, look at it, uh, of processes and um, specifications. We've made very few changes to the actual design plans after receiving that money, but we have had to go through a lot of additional steps to, to satisfy uh, the Department of Transportation that uh, we are being good stewards of those uh, federal and state dollars. So, um, here we are today. We are asking um, for town council to give town manager Robert Smith um, the authority to sign an agreement with the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, I believe it's attached. There's uh, it, it's quite a bit of reading. Um, that agreement is largely boilerplate. It's what the department uses for all the agreements, such as this. Um, We've, uh, we've also been working, I've got I've got to say thank you to Tanya. She's been doing a great job of coordinating with uh, FDOT staff who's been assigned to these types of uh, cost sharing tech projects in their local agency uh, projects department. And um, we're almost ready for construction. So after this, I'll give you a little bit of, of, of time frames. If, once this agreement, or once once you, we're authorized to sign the agreement, it'll take a little bit of time before um, we're ready to advertise for construction. That would probably be in early early uh, early 2025, so just a few months from now. And then you usually give about a month for the contractors to respond, a month for negotiations, things like that. Looking at starting construction at some point, probably early summer, and it's somewhere between 12 and 18 months. Um, uh, to get to substantial completion. And for those of you, this includes uh, some drainage improvements that will address some of the flooding that's been going on for, for, for decades, probably maybe even longer, um, up near the existing uh, bridge that goes up over the canal. Uh, this will provide a new pedestrian bridge. It'll remove the old pedestrian bridge. We, we spent some time with a previous version of the council looking at the specifics of what the bridge would look like, what sort of truss shape it would have, what color it would be. So um, a lot of this has been vetted some time um, with the tree board, making some adjustments to the path to, okay, what if, we, what if we just kind of meander this way a little bit to preserve a tree? And um, matter of fact, we, we made a couple of those changes uh, to the roadway and drainage plans, but need to still update the landscape plans to show the tree number these trees, number 87 and 88, were preserved. And then there were some also some changes in the rotary sign, um, as well as the, the roundabout itself. So 
a lot of work, a lot of time here. We are getting ready to receive a uh, total of approximately $1.7 million from the state and the federal government. Um, if you have any questions, I know I have clouds all over the place with this one, but um, by now I feel like we've had quite a few discussions about this project. So um, if there's any areas you'd like to cover further, uh, I'd be happy to do my best. So, Mike, just for clarity, we help us with we have the resolution 2024 08. So, just so everyone here understands exactly what we're doing. That approves us to move forward with the project and drop those funds down to the town, right? With federal and state funding. Um, then the next item is item two. I don't want to mix the two together, but that is the, the actualization of, of the agreement with FDOT, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, it will give the town manager authority to sign that agreement. So the two are they're commingled, but they stand. Uh, and, and again, this is like if, if you maybe you feel like, well, gee, the town manager has authority to do such things. This is something that uh, the Florida Department of Transportation is asking to be consistent with their procedures. Council, any questions for Mike? Council for Um, so based on the people that use it, it's my daughter's in school now. Um, I had some quite a couple people that had asked us some questions about. The actual trail, which I was at all the old meetings like five, six years ago. Yeah. So very familiar with the project, so that helps a little. Um, but one of the things people would ask me about was um these are their questions, but when you come off the bridge and you're on the north side of the bridge, right now that area is very elevated. And I don't know if it's because of septic tanks are under there. I seem to remember a lot of that in the past. And so people were asking if when the path comes off of there, is it going to be elevated with like a big drop off down to the, you know, the side swales or roads or whatever on either side? And if so, if there's going to be some sort of railing to make sure that kids riding bikes and things don't go you know, down that slope. Sure. So uh, to start with, I think that's just the old railroad uh, alignment. And so uh, that's that's how high the railroad was there historically. Now you're right, it is very forested. Um, it was, it was a little bit tough to get up there for some of the initial site visits to, 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 to fly, fly through, but um, it's flat enough and wide enough that there will not be a, a significant drive, drop off that would constitute a hazard. So there will still be enough space where it's relatively flat to not be not be dangerous, and it's also going to be freeze, freeze there. Um, but we, we did look at that based on a survey and, and we determined that there was no need to protect it with something like Handrails because once you get up there, you see it is, it is wide enough to, to have that facility without um, a significant drop on the median. Um, now that eventually it does slow down, and once you get just north of where the trees end, we would have um, the golf cart path would, would end. Just I know I didn't mention golf carts yet, but I apologize for that. Golf carts are allowed on the, the, on the bridge itself. So from um, Old Bain, if you, there will be a ramp specifically for golf carts that would then be able to get to the trail and bottlers to prevent golf carts from driving further north and south on the trail. Uh, but they would be allowed for that cross. So this would connect your southern portion of the golf cart network to the north side of town and, and vice versa. Um, once you get north of the wooded area, we didn't want to drop the golf carts out immediately because of that elevation difference you mentioned, and we just go over some water and uh, um, also through a lot of trees. We, we decided to take it right past where the sort of wooded area ends. Then the golf carts uh, would push over to the south of the golf. Okay, that just created another set of questions. <laughs> yeah, okay. I realized that I answered something. Okay, else, so that's okay. No, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, because one of so one of the other questions I got from people was how wide was the bridge going to be? Yeah. And if I thought the whole reason was, and, and where are the transitions occur because it said 10 to 14 feet for the width and um, over the face, not just specifically the bridge, but like the whole phase is in 10 to 14. So the phase one first question is which proportions are 10 feet, 12 feet, 14 feet? It looked like mostly 10 when I was looking, but that's right. That's right. So it's 10 or 14. It's not like it varies okay. here and there. It's 10 feet pretty much everywhere except where the golf carts are allowed. And in that area, we wanted more space, one, for them to be able to pass each other, but also just recognize that there's going to be multiple users at the same time. So only in the space where golf carts are allowed, which is 
generally over the canal, but again, say it extends north to the end of that wooded area. Um, so it's about seven. So that is 14 feet wide. The rest is, and then it goes back to 10 north of the bowels. We beat this pretty hard to death. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and we the, the end result that we wanted was becoming too well for us to be able to pass it. So it was a safe amount of uh, space for pedestrians and bicycles. So, is there, there, there was some thought to make it more narrow. I think because people didn't want to look so imposing, but at the same time, really felt it was important that we keep that safety line uh, for the kids. So my second question that has not popped in my head because of what you said was, um, and, and part of this question is for you, part of this question is for Robert, actually. So I thought that the whole reason that the trail was going to be 10 foot wide the whole way through town was for it to be a multimodal use path because state law says we have to have it wider than eight feet in order for golf carts to be able to use it. So I'm guilty of this as well as other people I've talked to that thought that the Holtworth trail was going to be able to be used for the golf cart, but it sounds like it's only the bridge. Correct. In many of those earlier discussions, um, Actually, the width at 10 feet is less than the standard width that uh, the, the state and most, most municipalities like to build trails. Um, typically, it's 12 feet, right? It's okay to do 10 feet, but typically it's 12 feet. And um, direction from the town at the time was concerned with speed. Like, cyclists to ride really, really fast when it's actually a line. So we narrowed it down in order to make it more friendly to people who are going less than 20 miles per hour, right? We wanted it to be a lower speed facility, recognizing all of the use that we get in town. And that's why it was narrowed. Instead of the standard 12, feet. Now, for the portion where we're sharing it with golf carts, it was prudent to widen that portion up to 14. Okay. Question for Robert is we had a conversation probably, I don't know, seven months to a year ago, somewhere in that general range about when the work trail was complete up to the school being able to do a step out on the east side of the elementary school's campus so that the golf carts could continue up through there and be able to park on that side but if we're not going to be allowed to use that area we're not going to be able to use that stretch of work trail between the bridge and the school how would that how what were you envisioning for the step out when we talked about it well, it'd be down that no need road. Remember, you got the road parallel to the trail system, besides when you get from Lake Buller Boulevard to the school, but then you can say look up Lake Buller Boulevard with the golf cart, and then you have to go down that no need road. That probably gets to the east side of campus park in the right of way that's between the wire road and like the grass area, because that's the part we're talking about. Onto school property. Yeah, the town, right? The property that is on the east side of the campus would be between the wire, the school building itself. Okay. That's I mean, the baseball field, sort of like where everyone parks for the baseball. Yeah, that's pretty much where you have the right of way lineage or lineation markers. That's where our property pretty much ends. Okay. The rest is all school or manners property. So you were meeting on the left side of the Nene Street, like Butler Extension, whatever it's called. Yeah. Our yeah. Okay. Okay, that, that helps me with my golf cart map stuff. Okay. All right, thank you. <clears throat> um, oh, I do have one other thing. So regarding the trees, I'm glad you said tree number 87 and 88 because they're actually on my list. Um, and then I know that there was some concerns brought up from um, tree board members for a couple of things. Um, one was, you know, that it was meandered in a lot of places, but there was a section that they're concerned about between Lake Butler Boulevard and Park Avenue. Two of those include those trees, but there were a couple other ones I think that they were concerned about meandering. So are we potentially able to tweak that on the other ones if they had other ones they were concerned on? Or? Do you have the tree numbers by any chance? I don't because we didn't think you guys get into the minutia of that tonight. Uh -huh. um, but I mean, I, I don't have to pronounce it. I can look, but it was, I know the concern was only primarily over the line. 
So it's, it's difficult to say anything definitive right. um, as a sort of rule of thumb. Like if it would affect the alignment, then I think we're probably past that point and there would have been a reason why we had the, the, the alignment in one area. Perhaps it has to do with water quality and swales. Without knowing, I can't really answer exactly. If it has to do with the species of tree or uh, uh, the space of the trees, then I say we still have uh, speaking with Tanya earlier today, she would be willing to to uh, take another look at some of the landscaping components. And from the OT's perspective, they just don't care. Like right? the town is funding the landscaping improvements, so whatever you want to do with that is up to you. Um, when it comes to the alignment, then I think we, we need to to stick to the the plan we have now. Partly just do the schedule, and I'm sorry that I can't give you a, a, a engineering rationale for why a decision. What what's we're saying. Okay, so that uh, in the drawings that were presented in the agenda packet, 87 and 88 are impacted. So there, the, the, you can, if you look at the roadway alignment that we did back, not roadway, I'm sorry, the trail alignment, we kind of bent it around them. Um, we did not update the landscape plans to remove the X of those trees and show the uh, um, root protection via the rebar chairs. And was that based on a conversation with people? The 87, tree number of 87 and 88, is that why you guys standard? It was saying, yeah, yeah, it was uh, uh, 2022 October. October 22nd. 22nd. We had a site visit with them. We did an entire walk. Modification to the alignment as a result of that event. Okay. Council, any additional questions for me? Yeah, it's a couple of songs we've already covered in the same year. Is that from six to the school? That's the first phase? That's the first one, two? Not only is six at the time we started, uh, the town did not own all of the right of way. So we started at north, okay, which was the sort of first stretch. Right. Yeah, so it's from there up to the park. Okay. And I, as far as meandering, the question is you can just my career. More meandering the better for slowing down traffic because it would be new bikes and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's good. Right. So, yeah, that's just, just my thing. Through emails. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we've been working with Stanley when we started. I, I know. <laughs> this is the reason I got 100 hours to do this in 2011. It was our first meeting, bro. <laughs> so, the more you meander, the less you go get. So, yeah, it's not. It's, uh, the process that the results are going to be spectacular. So really think we're going to be better. All right. Council, I'm looking for a couple of questions. So, we'll the so for the drawings that are in here, then everything that was presented in the packet other than tree 87 and 88 that say remove the remain are accurate for what was in the agenda packet. Yes, keeping in mind that um, the town still does have some leeway to make modifications related to the landscaping if they do not affect the alignment from the trail itself. Council, need for a motion to approve resolution 2024 080 New York Trail project. Mayor, a motion to approve resolution. Motion by Council for Second. 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 Thank you for your questions. Yes. Yeah. 
Next up is ordinance number 21, sorry, 2024 20, 1. Um, this is our annexation uh, item. We're going to have Brad present, and then we'll have a public hearing. Brad, Brad got us to do this as we do it. So the rules, just everybody knows the rules are a little different for um, the annexation. So uh, we'll see you later. Thank you, Mayor. I'm Brad Finish, so uh, what we have before you this evening is your first public hearing for the ordinance to consider the annexation of the Shondalak community, um, which is adjacent to the town of uh, their off the lake Butler Boulevard. Um, this is your first public hearing. Um, after tonight, then this will come back to you for your second public hearing. And at that second public hearing, which is scheduled for December 10th, uh, that's when you then make your motion, whether to approve or not to approve the annexation and also to set the referendum for that annexation. So tonight, as the mayor said, what this hearing is for tonight is to take any public input you have about this annexation and then to move it forward. Um, just a very, I'll give a very brief summary because we have talked this many, 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 many times. So I'll just give a very high level summary of this annexation. Um, so what we have done, we've gone through the process. There is a process under the statutes for annexation. The process that we're following here in town is what's called an involuntary annexation, which means it has to go through a referendum for it to be approved. So the area that we're looking at is the Shondalak community. Um, it's approximately, uh, I did the acres, but it's a little bit over 100 acres. It's 76 parcels. Uh, and the development itself, is very similar to the town already. The lot sizes are similar, the types of houses that are there, the community is very similar to what we have here in the Veneer already. This annexation area is comprised of four different areas within Shondu Lot. We have the Shondu Lot subdivision, we have the Park West subdivision, and then along Lake Butler Boulevard, uh, Lake Butler, there's lots that are not part of either one of those plats, but they're part of Shondu Lot. They actually have an agreement with the HOA, so they are part of that. And then we have that one property that is between the town and Chandra Lock, it's not behind the gates. So those are the four areas that are covered under the annexation to burn it in. Um, as you all know, we've had several workshops with the residents of Chandra Lock, as well as with the rest of the town residents here and with the council. And um, generally, we've gotten positive res responses to it from the residents of Chandra Lock. I will also this sort of my notes, this was initiated by the HOA at Chandra Lock. They approached the town for the annexation. That's what started this whole process. Um, the other important part of this is the process we're going through. Um, so one of the first things we had to do is we did the annexation analysis, which all have seen previously. But we went through the analysis to look at it, show it met all the statutory requirements for annexation. It's adjacent to the town. It's not a, it's a com it's a compact area. Um, and, and it's also developed for urban purposes. And I also just want to say urban purposes for annexation on the Florida statute is completely different than what Orange County talks about when they talk about their rural boundaries. This area is developed for urban purposes as defined by Florida statute. So we're fully compliant with all the prerequisites for annexation. The other part is procedural. So what we had to do with that study, we had to submit it to Orange County, to the mayor of Orange County. Uh, we did that in, in October. Um, and they then had an opportunity to review provide any feedback or concerns. Um, we received none. We had no objection from Orange County. Uh, Robert Smith and I, we met with Brian Brooks and John Weiss, a county administrator, county administrator, talked with them over the annexation. They had no concerns and they were actually Surprise that we annex in property not to promote development, we annex in property to protect development. So we're the opposite of what everybody else does. So they, they, they had no objections or concerns with our annexation from the county's perspective. So that, that requirement has been satisfied. Um, then we were required to send out notices to all the property owners within the annexation area. We also did that in October. We sent a notice by you know, of them of these public hearings and also of a potential future referendum. We didn't have a date yet, so the date's not in that letter they got. Um, and we sent that out. I received only one phone call from those letters, and it was from a new resident that moved in recently. And when I explained the annexation, she had no concerns about it. 
and she was in go get registered in the North County voter so she voted for referendum. Um, but I've gotten no other feedback from the letters that went out. And then we also, the town, we also published the required newspaper notice um, prior to tonight's hearing. So we've done all the procedural aspects correctly for this. In terms of the impact to the town with this, uh, we evaluated that, worked closely with, with Robert and, and all the directors, and really this is a small annexation. Um, it's only total, I think right now there's 51 houses there. I think it's built out, it's 56. It's build out people 120, 150, something like that. It's not a big annexation, doesn't have a big impact on our services in terms of what we do with the town. Um, the police department has confirmed they could easily serve that area and better than the county can. And with all other services we have, we can serve it. Um, it would also, for the town, generate some additional revenues for the town and add more taxes. It's about $399,000 based on last year's values when we did the study. Um, and then for a property owner within Sean Duloc, the average property owner, it'll be different for everybody. Um, the change for them if they came in on the property taxes they would pay and assessments they would pay, when they would come into the town, they would pay on average about $1,930 in additional taxes and assessments. Where that difference comes in is they will actually pay less and add more taxes, but they'll be paying more in assessments when they would come into the town. But again, as we met with the residents of Chandula, that value that they get far exceeds that additional cost that they will have. Um, so that's the overview of the annexation. And I will just say, so you have it. Again, you do meet all the criteria for annexation. Um, we don't see any, we'll see any objections moving us forward from the county or any other governmental agency as we move forward with that. So I'd be happy to try to answer your question to have. Council, any questions for Brad before we uh, hold the hearing? Brad, I'm sorry. Yeah, you said December 10th it would be the second public hearing. And then you mentioned said something about a referendum for annexation. Is it better for just the residents of Todd Rock referendum for a town meeting? Thank you, Sam. I need to talk about it. So, in the ordinance that you have before you this evening, um, first, it's set up the way it's established right now. It's only in the referendum for the voters of Sean Lock does not include the vote here of town voters. It's only for Sean Duloc. It's written that way because that was the direction we had the town council putting that together. Um, also, I, I need to talk about the referendum. Thing. In the ordinance you had before you this evening, when we put this together, we didn't have the confirmation from the supervisor of elections yet on the actual date. So in your ordinance that you have before you tonight, it says a, a referendum date of um, January 9th, but the actual date, we got confirmation of that today, will be January 29th. So when this comes back to you, 21st, 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 thank you, 21st. When this comes back to you on the 10th, that will be changed within the ordinance. We can continue on because it doesn't affect the title of the ordinance in any way. Um, we're just correcting the actual date inside the ordinance. So you're talking about the referendum for the residents of Chandra Law. Correct. Not residents of women. The way the ordinance is right now, the ordinance would have to be changed if that's what the council would want to do. Um, you would have to change an ordinance to say both Sean Lock and voters within the town of Flinders. Yeah, at a personal note, for me, it seems a little one sided for the residents of Sean Lock to get an opportunity to vote, an opportunity to require a to sue me. Are they required to vote? Are they required? Yeah, under Florida statute, the requirement yeah. is the folks that are being annexed, they have to be, have the ability to vote under a referendum. It's required. Because we're doing what's called a voluntary. <clears throat> the statute then says is that the local option whether or not the residents of the town, the voters of the actual town, vote as well. It's not a requirement. It's an option, but it's not required. I think it's popular asking are the people who live in Chandala all required to come out and vote for it. Is that what you yes. Oh no, it's a simple majority. It's it, on, on the referendum, and it's the same whether it's Chandala voters or town voters. It's 50% plus 20. Yeah. Of the well, I think what I'm trying to get is, principally speaking, it seems a little one sided that the residents, and I'm just supporting it, by the way. It just seems a little one sided that the residents of Sean Duloc are voting on whether they want to become residents of Winnie Green. the residents want to say so, whether or not they want to manage him. I think it should be both people, town residents and Sean Duloc residents. 
for the young man. And once again, I support annexation for a lot of all the right reasons. <clears throat> I think that, in my opinion, it's always been in my opinion that all annexations should be a referendum in my country. On both sides. For the same reason that Sean Delac is a referendum in my country. It's just as important for us to live here as it is to people who live in Sean Delac. That's, that's, that's my opinion. And also, it's not a technical decision, it's basically a decision of the council. Yeah, so I guess that's what I'm trying to make. So it's clearly at the council, right? So, you know, I think what I would say to that is you have a, an annexation that is a, a relatively small size, minimal impact, the character matches character of the town. Um, the difference uh, between having a referendum for those who live in Chung Lock who don't have a say here, say your, your constituents from town, have, that's our job to represent them. Uh, and to vote according to how we feel that the town we would make. Is it is it an option to have a full referendum? Yes, they're very rarely successful. So you're pretty much spinning your wheels if that's what you want to do. So they're not. Uh, they're when you get into a referendum of the of, of the entire body, it's like it's like housing for it's like low income housing. People love it. But he says we ought to have it. So very few people are willing to do it. So it's just one of those nice things. So you do that, but they're very, very least. So in my opinion, if the residents of Windermere voted not to have Sean Delock and his skin, that would be a valid reason to have a referendum. Because well, not having a referendum, the fear that the residents might not support it. Is not the right reason not to have a That's my opinion. That's okay. So remember that all I'm saying is that this body represent, representing the entire town and community. Sure. And I've talked to a lot of people, most who are supportive because they feel that this, the word I get the most from this one is like, this is a no brainer. What they worry about are larger organizations. You know, those are those can be character changing, those can be community changing, those can change the way you need to set your charter up, the way you need to vote, the way you need to set up your your uh, elected representation. Yeah. Um, this particular annexation is much smaller than that. It doesn't reach that level of impact with the community. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally willing yeah. to yeah. 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 I agree with everything you're saying. I understand your perspective on it, that you need the representation of five. Now the county people that are up here, I think certain things should be referendum highly. I don't think we should not have a referendum because we're afraid of the result. I don't think we're afraid. I think we're elected to make good decisions. And, and this is part of the job. Um, I think trying to throw everything out for referendums on that council. I don't I don't recommend throwing everything out for referendums. I do. One of the things I've brought to my own myself, and I think, is that annexation is a referendum. Okay. And I would say, Tiffany, for everything that you've said now, I have had a couple of people come to me and say that they think it's a good idea to annex in China Walk, and I have friends in China Walk that I know want to be annexed in. That being said, the majority of people that I spoke with have said the exact opposite. They some of them have said that even if they want Sean the Volcanics, they want the right to have a vote on it. So let me ask this, Brad, um, because I know this is the first reading and we have another reading at the um, December 10th. So at some point, if we were to have a lot of residents that express their concerns, because unfortunately the ones that have expressed concerns to me, I have told them, please email the other council members so that they're aware that this is how people are feeling. Some of them are new residents, some of them are really old long-term residents, um, but I don't think that they've done that yet. So if there were to be, you know, an onslaught of people coming out and, you know, expressing their opinions on this between now and the December 10th one, is there still an option for us as a council to change our decision on whether we extend the referendum to us? You, you can make the change all the way up to your motion on December 10th. Yes. Just a question for the difference in cost for a referendum for the entire town versus the cost for just the Shangri-La residents. What's your estimate of that difference? Uh, about four thousand dollars. Four thousand dollars additional to do a complete referendum for the entire town versus uh, 
what would have just shown the bottom? It's 30,000 according to our budget grant that we passed. Yeah, not, 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 no, that's for all elections. Okay, okay. so it wasn't for the comes up in March. But um, for the for Sean DeLock by itself, I'm waiting on a quote from the election office to be exact, but I wouldn't work, I wouldn't see that it's gonna be in, like maybe two thousand, but maybe maybe between advertising and all that, which we have done with this, of course, it's been bad. Yeah, 10% or yeah. less than what we have lot wise now. So okay. if we're talking about outcome is that super majority vote. So when you encompass the whole town, then you have to have that that number. Yes, right. I don't know if it was just the sheer cost of the entire mm -hmm. referendum. Yeah. And to the prior point that the town council is here vote for the for the town of New Year. The, the referendum you know by sending that to the town of the residents that has the town of New Year represented by the town council plus the shot of the residents this went to annexation before then on the past, correct? No. They never they like never did the four corners and that one so they never made that off. Yeah, so they didn't have to pay the referendum for that one. And I believe if we we talked about support that yeah. all the other were annexed and we did not do. Is that correct? Correct. And they were much larger than this. Yeah. This, this is a very, you know, this is filling in the cracks. Like of a better term, you might control. The, the more you control the borders of your community, the more you can control the quality of life. That's what we strive to do here. This is about getting big. This is this is just about maintaining and increasing. A uh, little bit of tax base, so we're able to provide additional services, additional opportunities. Uh, these folks already think they're in town, anyways, uh, <laughs> and they're going to add. They're going to add to our community. Um, it's very low, low risk. Also, the council made the strategic determination uh, many years ago when we discussed annexations in depth that any time that we have the ability to annex waterfront area. This is concurrent with, with all of that. Um, somebody had told me that once upon a time, because you're saying that we never had to, we never went to, you know, full referendum or whatever, these past ones. So I had a, a resident, and I honestly don't remember exactly which one it was, but they, I believe they were a former council member at the time when Willows was annexed in, and they were told that there was no negatives to the Willows being annexed in. So then after the Willows got annexed in, uh, Orange County School District came along and said, now your population has increased over a certain point, and now you have to hire your own school resource officer, whereas we didn't need that before. No, I think that's happening. No, I mean, there's no resource officers back then, I don't think. Dang, I, 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 that I, 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 yeah. What's the council person saying? Okay, yeah, I just I'm curious because that's a long, long, long time ago. I'm like, I don't think we even had resource officers back then. Or some, some people do with the school district. I believe that's what they said. Yeah, yeah. Wait, we, uh, oh, there you go. There's your past yeah. member. The, the Marjorie Stone and Douglas Act is what um, required Orange County Public Schools to put SROs at the schools. And Orange County, that's why they go ahead and enter into agreements with local municipalities to provide that SRO. It has nothing to do with population. Okay. They, they enter in and speak with us because the school will be in our municipal boundaries. But yeah, they, they, to this very day, they pay us to do that. It's not quite as much as we would like to get. We do differ with them and what we feel it costs to have that officer, but at the end of the day, and what's important to annexation does not change school assignments. It has no impact on that at all. There's no change in school. I'm learning the part of it. I'm sorry, one more question. Do I, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't really have to answer on how much it would cost for the last half of the revenue of the town of annexation or something. For the entire town? Well, whatever we take away from that. If you do the entire town, that would be like $4,500, $5,000. If you do just Sean the Lock area, fifteen hundred and eighty-two thousand. So four thousand dollars. Personally, I don't think that's 
a lot of money in the grand scheme of all these projects we've got going on. Wait, one of them now. They were forty percent. Oh, absolutely. And as soon as I get it, I can pass it along to everyone. Yeah. And once again, just to clarify, I am not opposed to it. So obviously, we're going to vote on it for it. It's just the principal thing for me. I'm not going to bring it back to you. But if you do anything, I'm sleeping. You got an answer. It's a principal thing for me. The rest of the show. All right. Any additional questions at this time, Council? All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, close the council meeting. We'll open up a hearing. I'll read the entire or read the heading of the ordinance. Um, then any uh, who wishes to speak on this item to the public may feel free to do so. Do not have to have been signed up prior to the meeting or anything else. Um, then you will get all of our information. Close our meeting or town council meeting at 7.05 p.m. We open a public hearing uh, at 7.05 p.m. And this is a hearing on <clears throat> the whole thing right here. There's the numbers right. Ordinance number 2024-01, annexation. An ordinance of the town of Windermere, Florida, pertaining to town boundaries, expanding the town boundaries by annexing into the town's corporate limits certain lands known as the Chalky Lock community, which is comprised of the platted subdivision of John Lock, Park Avenue West and unplatted lots along Lake Butler, consisting of approximately 102 acres, redefining the boundary lines of the town, calling a special election for the purpose of holding a referendum by mail ballot that the registered voters in the area to be annexed and whether the annexation should be approved, providing for severability and providing for effective dates. At this time, anyone who wishes to speak on this item can come and join us at the See none. We'll close our public hearing at 7.06 p.m. and reopen our Windermere to Town Council meeting at 7.07. Brad, are we good? Do we need to vote at this juncture or no, should I move this forward? Yes, no, we'll get the summer time. That's when we think that's what would be a very good discussion. Next up is item B. This is the Ways Committee Appointments. There are seven appointments. Um, first one is for Anna Ander, Claire O'Malley, Emerson Elliott, Emily Shore, Lauren Williams, Aja Ander. Did I say that right? Maya. Close. Maya. Maya. <laughs> Trying to make it harder than it is. Um, and Sophia, uh, Sophia Hart. Um, Council, you can approve all of these appointments as one motion or separately. I make a motion to appoint to um, approve all of them. Motion to approve by Council Person David. Second. Second, council person added. Any questions, comments, or concerns, council? Just really proud of them because they uh, had our first meeting. And I'm just really proud of them. Again, uh, voting, council person Aye. 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 Thank you, council. Next up is Long Range Planning Committee, um, and this is an appointment of Paul Pantosi II. Looking for a motion to approve, Council. Motion to approve. Motion to approve, Council. First, yeah. Nevitt, second, Williams. Again, voting with Council Person Haynes. Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimous. Next up, contract and agreements. This is approval of the Third Avenue and Magnolia Street Bessie Drainage Phase 2 sub recipient agreement 4337 443-A with uh, the Florida Division of Emergency Management. Staff recommends approval. This is tabled from our October 26, 2024 Town Council meeting. And we have Kimberly Horn present, right? Now, how are you? Sir? I'm doing great. Thank you. Good to have you. <laughs> so, how chat with Kimberly Horn. So, here to talk to you about the third Magnolia, uh, known as the Bessie Project. Uh, so, this has been several years in the making as well. Uh, similar to Ward Trail, we uh, had to go through a process to get FDM approval for the grant. Um, for the phase two grant, I'll go into a little bit more on the details of that in a bit. Uh, just a general overview of the project that you see on your screen. I'm going to talk about the project in its entirety, and then I'll talk about the different phases 
and the process by which we got to this point with MPM. So the purpose of this project is to improve the drainage, both from the conveyance, erosion control, and sediment control to improve the water quality of the lakes. Uh, the project, I'm going to start from west to east and kind of move from south to north. So we're making drainage and degrading improvements from uh, Main Street, so on 9th, 9th Avenue, uh, Oakdale, up to East 8th, and then around over to Bessie, up to uh, 6th. So that is the scope of the project. And throughout this project, we work with the town, um, the, the residents, as well as the tree board to uh, provide uh, drainage improvements and regrading along the corridor. And um, in February of 2022, we submitted final plans over to FDEM as part of the HMGP grant. So the uh, HMGP grant starts with two phases. So phase one is uh, basically approval of the design to allow you to move to phase two, which is the construction funding. So uh, during phase one, we had to go back and forth with FDM quite a bit uh, based upon a benefit cost analysis, uh, which is also known as a BCA. So we wanted to submit the entire project, which we did to FDM and get approval but we just could not meet the benefit cost analysis requirements of FBEM. So in early 2023, in February, um, we discussed it with, with Tanya uh, and with Robert and others in the town. And in order to meet the BCA, we split the project up. So the way that you see it right now, phase one in kind of that green color is the downstream basin. So that's where you kind of get the most bang for your buck with the drainage improvements. So separating that out into two phases with uh, phase one being in green, we were able to make that BCA work. And what that means is that the DBM would provide 75% of the construction funding for that portion, and the town would do a 25% uh, partial match. So where we are now is that DEM after working with them for about two years. We started in February 2022, we're in the end of 2024 right now, has approved um, phase one of the project to go to phase two, which is construction. So the green area to go to construction. So what's before council tonight is to um, approve the signature of that phase two contract to take phase one to construction with a DEM funding. So now I'm going to move to phase one, which is the area of blue. So for phase one, that portion unfortunately did not meet the BCA that was required. So that portion would be town funded. But the intent is to advertise the entire project, phase two and phase one at the same time. And we talked to um, FDA about it, and they were fine with advertising it as one bid so that the town gets the economy of scale. Um, more bidders and hopefully better bid prices. Um, but what we would do is we would just separate out the invoicing and the quantities for the two projects so that the phase um, so the phase one could be invoiced FDM reimbursement and phase two would be entirely in the town. Um, so that's kind of where we're at and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Sure. So for <laughs> benefit cost analysis, so the difficulty with the benefit cost analysis, the way DEM um, handles it, is really the benefit is to mitigate the cost associated with flood damage. So for these roads, even, you know, we all know that they wash out, they erode, uh, they cause a lot of maintenance, a lot of interruption, uh, a lot of a lot of hardship within the right of way, and there's a cost associated with that. There was not a lot of flooding associated with finished finish floor elevations. So basically, you have a component that's kind of maintenance and damages within the right of way, and you have a bigger component, which is damages due to flood encroachment within the actual finished floor elevations of the structures. So we went through and we had to run numerous storm events and provide information on the benefit in dollars and the DDM as a tool where they compare that to the cost of the project. And that's how they come up with their benefit cost analysis. And the goal is to try to get that greater than one, where the benefit exceeds the cost parameter. 
So essentially it's an ROI on the mitigation investment by the state and the federal government. Um, so that that is the tool that they use to kind of say, this is a solid project versus maybe one that's not as valuable. Correct. And what are some of the things that have impacted ROIs over the last, so you know, this is a 4337 project started in 2018. Uh -huh. So the cost of escalations impact the ROI, so that's why it's so tight. For sure. So, you know, we submitted in February of 2022 uh, based upon those construction costs. We did an update in 23 when we did well called the plan split because after we got the BCA to work and we were able to get that um, um, concurred with with FDM, we actually split the plant up in February of 2023. And so we did a new construction cost estimate and, you know, the price went up. And now when we go to bid, you know, we'll have to see what the bid prices are, but the construction prices are still in the third year. What are some of the advantages of combining the two together and advertising as one? What does that allow us to save? You know, mobilization? Right, it allows you to save on, save on mobilization. It allows you to save on any type of maintenance or traffic. It also allows you to get one contractor on board so you get economies of scale when it comes to material procurement. It also helps you from a schedule perspective because one contractor will work the entire project instead of trying to have two contractors there at the same time. When you have two contractors working in one area, there's often um, the uh, likelihood of claims and things like that just because you don't know who did what to which part of the project. So he did this kind of deal. And really it's, you know, with the competitive environment that we have now for contractors, they're not really bidding on small jobs. So the bigger jobs also allows you to perhaps get more contractor bids, which hopefully will help you get bigger, uh, better bids. Thank you. That's very helpful. And Paul, as a reminder, it's also questions. being bid with Butler as well. We're yeah. we're okay. bidding it with Butler as well. Excellent. So we're going to we're going to maximize the economies of scale here wherever we can. Yes. Gives us better contractors, gives us better time performance. So pointing fingers back and forth, and hopefully um, allows us to uh, have more competitive bids. Yes, sir. Counselor. Just to confirm, Robert, so the budget numbers we have in the town budget includes our cost management for the FDM phase of this project, as well as our working. Yes, sir. And, with, and that includes the current working estimate, the data assessment that we've done. Yes, sir. And, and what is that number? What is what we have in this project? That's over the town. <laughs> The match is about what, 193,000? Yeah, so I have that number in front of me. So for phase one, the match is uh, roughly 205,000. And then for phase two, which is entirely funded by the town, that is estimated at 587,000. So I mean, yeah, so roughly 205 and 587. And this funds come from our stormwater. Assessment, correct? It'll come from stormwater and also due to the longevity of the project, it'll probably run into two fiscal years. Okay. Also, I need a condition. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't okay. off. Yeah, I can. There has been so much confusion on this project. Um, so with, with the cost, because I mean, in, in the agenda packet, it says we're proving phase two. Then the entire thing is presented. I feel like there's a lot more clear explanation with what you said tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like I'm not even sure the numbers don't match up because I'm seeing a total cost of 902000 for the part that's being funded with FEMA. So is that the total cost of phase two? Or phase one, and what portion of that is the towns? Because I, and what was in the agenda packet is 641000 total cost for the part that is stamped to be funded by the town. And then there's a to be funded with Stephen's grant, and it says 902000 So, sure. So, I can explain that. So, uh, what's in the package includes the engineering costs, which is part of phase, and we probably should call it segment one and segment two. But this is phase one and phase two of weather design and construction. So the total cost of roughly 902000 I think you mentioned, for, um, for phase one um, is for the, includes the design. And so that 
that portion has already been completed as part of the phase one agreement. So the phase two agreement only addresses the construction costs, which is the, the 819. So the 819 is phase one according to what you had highlighted in blue and whatever other color. I want to be clear on that because yes, that one should have been called something other than segments because yeah. it's created mass confusion. Right. So all of the neighbors and environment. Right. So uh, just a, a little bit of clarity and then I'll, I'll answer the question is that DEM calls the design phase phase one and the construction phase phase two. And then when we and then so when we split the plans. We probably should have called it A and B or something. Um, but phase one of the plans is the area that was in green, which is the area that's east of Oakdale. And then the phase I two. Like Park. That like Bessie's Park. And then phase one. Phase one. For the purposes of construction. For the purposes of the construction. Okay. And then phase two, for the purposes of construction, is Oakdale and then west of Oakdale and then the portion of A. Uh, west of east. Okay. All right. So give you those numbers one more time. Please. Sure. So, so this, and I'm going to use the term construction to, to make it not confusing. Yes. But for, for phase one that was in green, the construction based upon our engineer's estimate as of October 2023 is $819,424 for construction. And that is to be funded as a cost share. Correct. So our share, what again, please? The 25% of the 819.424 is 204,850. The other portion is? Sure. The other portion, which is phase two, which was in uh, purple and blue up there, is uh, totally town funded. And based upon our October 2023 construction cost estimate, is 586385 So combined, we're talking about $690,000. For the tax? Yes. Uh, roughly seven ninety. dollars Sorry, I'm going bad No problem. Okay, so now that we have the cost clarified, um, now I have some other questions. Um, so I went back and I reviewed the 45% uh, public workshop that we had and the 90% public workshop that we had. And um, I believe it was the 45% workshop, Victor from your team mm -hmm. had basically explained that how we call bringing the roads back to the historic elevations that they were has to be worded in a very specific way so that we're not, I think it was something to do with the OT. Um, so there's been some confusion for the neighbors, especially uh, on parts of um, eight where it goes from Magnolia down to the lake. Mm -hmm. And also on the portion of nine to the east of my property where it goes down between the Bardos and the Betty Strong Zone, where the, the slope is very, very steep. Yeah. So according to the scope of work that was presented in October 22nd council meeting, it said that you guys are going to be removing seven inches of the soil from the road and putting seven inches back. So we had questions, were we raising the roads up to where they used to be? Because if not, that means that the existing soils that are tying in on either side of the road would have to be dug down lower than where they are already standing. And we did not get an answer on that last month. Um, and we asked for those answers. Unfortunately, we did not get, I don't think we ever got those answers other than me going back and digging um, on the videos. But when I looked at back then, he had a magenta line that represented the historic versus the existing. It did look like it was moving up three feet in some locations and two feet in other locations in order to bring it back to the historic heights. So is that or is that not happening on those steep slope parts on both 9th and 8th Street? So it is happening. So if you look at our plans, you'll see a solid line, which is the proposed profile, which is also defined as the top of finished grade of your dirt road. 
And if you see the dashed line, that's the existing road which has been washed out over the years. So you'll see that throughout the low areas, as you go down to uh, the lake um, and over to east, that we are providing, um, we are raising the road up in those areas uh, based upon our proposed profile. Now, let me talk a little bit about the six and seven inch cut. So, you know, we've been working with uh, with a vendor for that face shell based paper material that's been used around the town and it's been working really well. And Tanya and I have been working with this vendor. So the spec is that we're going to remove the six inches of existing, and then we're going to put back this, a minimum of six inches of the shell rock paper base, but then we're going to be adding a foot or two foot, depending on the profile of the road, so that you'll have more than six inches. But the minimum that we're asking the contractor to remove and replace is six, but then he still has to fill in compact and lifts up to the finished grade shown in our profile. How will that tie into the existing driveways and um, right of -ways? So with that, we do have details for the driveways, so they, they will tie into the driveways. So we do need to have that. So let me ask this. Mm -hmm. Because on the drawings, and I'm looking at, um, there's no plan sheet number technically on here, but it is the portion of the road that is from the west side of my property, or east side of my property, going down to the uh, fire retention area that's on the Bessie Park in the south. Mm -hmm. So between the Bardos and Strawberries. So I noticed that it is, they've already got a huge issue. <laughs> A very recent, uh, more recent, somewhat issue, I would say, of water coming down in sheet flow, massive amounts of CFS, CFS um, in terms of cubic feet per second of water coming both onto Bardo's property and onto the Strawman's property. It comes down their driveways um, at the Bardo's property. When it goes down their driveways, then it also sinks around and follows their papers. It's going right next to the foundation of their homes. On Strong's property, it is crossing her driveway in about a 40 foot swath, and then it's going next to her porch, her garage, and it travels around the back and goes up next to the back of her foundation. So, when I'm looking at these drawings, and what we're saying here is that the road is now going to be higher than the side swales that are on either side of it. I also noticed that on the driveways, I am seeing that the flow of water is showing the water going up. Our driveways. It's going up. Uh, they have two driveways on this uh, plan. Their main one that goes to the neighbors of the carport and the car does, and the secondary driveway with gravel. And both of those show water going up those. So I feel like that that may exacerbate our problem on the water coming off the road, even if the water adjacent to either side of the driveway is going into the slab. So why do those arrows reflect? So your concern is water from the road flowing down into the driveway and into the property? Correct. Okay. Because right now it's already a problem and this looks like it's going to continue. Okay. So if you notice that on either side of the driveway, so we typically have a DVI, which is a ditch bottom inlet, a pipe system as well. So, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to maximize the improvements within the right of way while reducing impacts to trees, landscape, and everything else in the area. So at every driveway, we are trying to catch as much water from the road as we can. And that's why next to each driveway, you see the ditch bottom inlets. So that will, that will the, the swells will catch the water and the DBIs will catch the water. And then we're also doing a pipe system as well. So a combination of all those things will catch a majority of the water that would have gone even more so into the driveway. Some water will go in the driveway just because of the elevations that are out there, but we're trying to catch the water right before the driveway and right after the driveway in every single day. From what's coming off the road. From what's coming off the road. On the yes. property. On the property. And so, yes, we are, we are catching as much of the runoff within the driveway as possible with our swales and our ditches and, I'm sorry, with our swales and our ditch bottom. So what's, I mean, what's to prevent, I mean, if the project works as function, mm -hmm. 
what portion of the water that's currently coming off of upstream basin areas from the intersection of Oakdale and I northward, what percentage of that water is still going to be coming around down the road as a makeshift stream bed? Is all of it going to be collected so that the only rainfall that we're going to see on the adjacent properties is the rainfall that's literally landing on the road and right away is adjacent to our properties? That or is, are we still going to have some from upstream? The, the intent is for us to catch a majority of the upstream runoff. And, and that was the reason for the project. And that, so we graded swells throughout the project. And because we couldn't get the swells to be big enough because of impacts, we also added in the two pipes. So they work together to capture as much water drainage as possible. So, you know, a majority of the water coming from the upstream basin at Oakdale and Maine, as it goes down to east, will be caught in the swells in the stormwater systems. The portion that would flow down the driveway should be just the immediate portion right where the driveway is. So like, for example, the road is 10 feet wide, their driveway apron is 20 feet, you're saying it should be the rainfall that falls in that 200 square feet. Correct. Roughly that area in front of their house or in front of the driveway. Okay. What was the design storm event? Uh, I'd have to check. I want to say the swells are probably a 10 year, 10 year time for the swells. And I do recall on the 90% um, meeting with that. Uh, well, actually, yeah, it was at the end of the 90% meeting. Um, Mark Collins asked that question, and um, Victor had said that you guys had different criteria to meet for different things like South Water Management District versus whatever. And that in general, he said that it was designed to a 100 year event to accommodate all the other requirements. That's what I recall it being said. I don't know if that's still. Um, so for the 100 year, I think that's. I think that's part of the modeling that's done for DEM. We model different storm events for DEM. Uh, it's it's difficult to contain the 100 year within the right of way, and that's part of the BCA. Um, so at the 100 year, we do model that, and that's how much it approaches, if any, outside the right of way. Um, so I have a couple of other questions. Um, this is going to be more specific to the retention of ponds, or not retention ponds, our bio. Wales, rain gardens. Rain gardens. Yes. So we have two of those um, in Lake Valley Park. Uh, the one at the northern end, and these are the plants that were approved and signed, sealed, and delivered um, to me. Uh, there are discrepancies in it in one place. Uh, we say that at the north end, if that's part of by the triangular shape, one I'll just call it the triangle, the oval one. So the triangle is the one to the north, mm -hmm. the oval is the one to the south. In the triangle uh, retention area, there is a tree there that says 18 inch unknown tree to be removed, now to replant at a different location. However, on another page of the drawing, that tree is left there and not removed. Uh, in the 90% discussions we had on the public input workshop, there are two oaks there, and the goal was to avoid those. I know that the uh, that's not like primal, it's long as thin UV now that I'm looking at it, but the old one was primal. Anyway, but that area has shifted um, from what was originally proposed in the 45% drawing, but there's nothing on here saying whether or not those trees are remaining or whether those trees are being removed. Um, and also, based on the, I'm assuming for the, the contour lines here, this is a somewhat terrace slope down into the bottom of the retention area. Is that correct? It's a it's a gradual slope from the roadside down to um, the swell area, so it's sloping down. Okay, but within this within the um, retention area itself, so the sidewalls that come down are they just straight grade? Because it looked like by the plants or like box. Um, I believe they're straight. I can double check. Okay. So the bumps are the jobs, the, like, the bumps are the jobs for the, um, the the pond itself, but it is a straight slope going down. So it's not like it goes down steps and it goes down just straight okay. down this constant slope. Okay. So what is the intent and the plan for those oak trees? Because I know they were discussed at the 90% workshop, but they're not accounted for here. And I, I believe we were able to avoid those trees, but I can definitely double check on that. <clears throat> um, we also, 
In regards to both these soil, or sorry, rain gardens, in, re in, in regards to the rain gardens, um, I had a meeting today uh, with somebody from the tree board who asked if it is possible, because we went out there and we looked, and you know, this hasn't been staked out down there around this. I know that Susan Carter, when she was on tree board a few years ago, did go out and walk these project sites. Um, and they're fully understanding of the pine trees and all that along these to find that. But for this location and the other location, they were hoping that maybe, I know the size cannot be made smaller, but that it could be squished a little bit to be just a little bit more away from the base of those trees because the, the toe shape of these, <clears throat> where they're planning to put it, is with, on the one to the south, it's within 10 foot of the trunk of one of our heritage oaks. And on this one up here is pretty close to one. So are we able to do a change order after this is approved or what that whatever point in the process to push that and move them just, you know, maybe five or so feet away from that? I think that there is an ability to do that as long as we make up for that volume somewhere else. I, well, they don't want to change the size. I mean, we understand that the size, um, based on what was discussed at the 90%, was this is pretty much the smallest we can go on all of the things. It's really just a matter of, you know, maybe squishing the shape a little bit fatter here or narrower there so that it moves a little further. Away. Yes, I'm not changing the volume. I think, I think that could be done if you if you squeeze one side, then you got to expand another side right. by about the same amount. So, yes, that could be done with either a plant or rigid where we can re recontour the rain garden slightly on one side to run more separation of the tree and expand it on another, or it can be done as a fill change if it's minor enough. Okay. So, um, can I help you out on that a little bit? We spent a lot of time with this with Paracoyer and the whole intent was when we did the design, the shape of the pond really remains almost unchanged in what's currently in the new plans. And those are the field conditions that we will work through to ensure that those two lineups within that basin are not affected. Because we're not going to get into the side slope. I mean, we'll work with how we'll work with them during the time frame to ensure that we have the same and proper volume that we need to have to ensure that those two trees are not affected. I think in what I'm working on with them is there is a magnolia that could possibly go. Um, because we, it's dead, we we're doing all the pine trees, so right. we're doing an arborist report. That's all been part and parcel to what we've already pre planned, and the shaping of the pond will be done organically in the field. And there's, I mean, there's also one climb of the tree that's down at the southern end across from Denny's Strawberry Zone that's yeah. by the end of the rain garden. Well. So we had three that we were Yeah, so about. when we were meeting with Victor in the time that we were shaping the ponds and laying them out, those will all be massaged. To allow us to make sure that we ensure that, and therefore we'll be walking along the way with us to make sure that as we shape ponds, everything will be good. Okay. Um, I did have another question. It says there was a maple tree to be pursued across from the corner of Joe Tenzer's house. Did that tree come down? Yes, it's already been built. I think that's our experience. Um, and then the one other thing is uh, for the landscape plan, are we, are we able to tweak that as well? Uh, so I, I want to go back to the, the tree, uh, the oak tree, um, Freddie. So I would, uh, Councilman. So I was looking through the um, the plans and the the way that we set the plans is if the tree is to remain, we don't do a call out, and we only call the trees to be removed because if we call out every single tree to remain, we might forget one. And so the protocol is, or the the intent in which we'll convey to the contractor is everything is to remain unless we tell you to remove it. Which is the more conservative approach? Okay. Um, as far as the, the the rain garden, I'm not a landscape architect specialist, but you know there are certain plants that are suitable for removing those nutrients and things like that that we want to accomplish. So I would say that if there are plant species that the council uh, would prefer, or if the residents would prefer, there's an opportunity as long as they match the same functionality. Okay. Um, the, the other portion, so there's three things. One, um, that, you know, based on conversations with residents and tree board was, you know, for native species, we have a couple in there that aren't. So okay. that's something that could function the same way. Um, one of the other concerns was 
that it's using um, brown beauty mulch was named. One place it said one kind of mulch, cypress, another place it said a different kind of mulch. Um, and there was a concern of using something that's more of a renewable resource, such as pine needles. Um, I don't think we want to be using dyed mulch anywhere near our lakes, which we can have the lakes consult and maybe chime in on this one um, because we need that one out. But dyed mulch is banned in Europe and other countries. And uh, I just had information out on it as well. So we'd rather see something like a pine mulch. The third concern was not actually the plantings, but rather the rock at the bottom. And I've had conversations with John you know, recently, and I'm fully aware of that the goal is that no sedimentation is going to be happening because we're taking care of that elsewhere, and that is water that's coming in there. But we do still have two giant oaks at the one base of Grain Bar, and we have another oak at the other one. So we are still going to have leaf litter. We're still going to have things that get in there, and the rocks at the bottom are just going to get filled in. So one of the comments that was brought up to me today was, well, it would be better if it was just sawed in the bottom so that it could be maintained easier from our maintenance crew if they need to go out and do something, and to not have dirt and stuff fill into the river rock in the bottom that is ultimately just going to end up growing weeds because stuff's going to fall there and be folks. So for you, know, when you use something like the rocks, you do get some exfiltration, you know, properties which helps the um, grain garden. Uh, substituting it with sod would be a change that I would have to run by our landscape architects and our drainage folks. With that being said, you know, everything that you mentioned, we can definitely consider and discuss, and we can issue a plan revision um, uh, before it goes to bid to show those preferred materials as long as they function the same way for uh, water quantity and water quality. I think that's one of my questions, other than I'd like to hear from the president. Now that some of the other things have been answered. Mayor, one thing too. Yes, I, I know this is going to come off is the fact that the potable water system out there as well. The, the intent always was to try to put potable water, water out there at the same exact time that these projects we're going to be put in again. We were working on this since 2018. Prices have escalated, as you can see, in a lot of these costs that we're proving tonight, and that's subsequently uh, proved for like West Second Avenue and also for the central phase for uh, the total water system. Where we anticipated that to be 3.081 million, and that's only going to get us 25 percent of what we anticipated to do in the central phase. Um, so, again, the intent was always there to put that in at the same time. Fortunately, the town doesn't have the funds uh, to do this right now. But the intent is always to continue to try to work with you know the lobbyist firm that we're going to be uh, hiring hopefully in the next two months to try to get us that potable water system or the money for that potable water system, uh, which we originally intended on putting there at the same time. Not adding the potable water at this point is not showing which is the effectiveness of the design criteria for this particular project. That was just something we had hoped to combine while we had the earth open to do the as well. But, but you know, we don't have the finances for that infrastructure. That funding's not available. We can't continue to delay this project because we'll be uh, in jeopardy of losing our FM money. Yeah. Uh, that money will just go somewhere else. So we'll be in some other project. But, Um, I know that we had several residents defer who wish to speak on this project. It's uh, Nancy Wardo, Bill Wardo, and Jane Plant. So if you come to the podium, we're going to drag us, ask us any questions or share your concerns, and try to address this as well as we can. Bill Wardo, look at 225 East Avenue. Avenue. Uh, I sat up there for 10 years, 1982 to 1992, and this reminds me of 1980 when the town hired consultants to do a drainage project that we need to do in the whole town. It was going to be $400,000. What does that translate today? Probably $4 million. But it included all the bases, it included person force and well, we always have problems, like downs, like Bessie. And we had a, uh, we, we had Charlie True, who's an engineer, lived in town. 
at probably 30, 40 years experience as an engineer. He drew up engineering plans to fix the problem. We put it in and it worked. It didn't work so well down at first and forth. It didn't work so well down Lake Day down facing. But it worked really well in the Lake Festival. Day. So we only had a tractor, Elmer and Richard Clapper, two, a two-man public work. So they weren't maintained very well over the year. And, and they went into disrepair and they're pretty much dysfunctional now. But for 20 years, I've been begging, just go out there and fix them. Just go out there and clean them out. My road never washed out when those things got put in, when those swales got put in up there, never. And we had to go through Scott Brown, who all he wanted to do was pave the roads. And it was like he punished us by running water down we <laughs> running water down our roads until we told, oh, Uncle, okay, bring us to pay roads. I'll fix everything. Well, how did that work out? He must have, he probably had the biggest meeting he ever had of angry citizens of paying roads in this town. So I thought it was all over after that. I thought, you know, time is coming in now. And, oh, we're going to take a different approach. Maybe they'll finally go up there and fix those swales. But no, now we've got another project. Now you guys are going to spend three quarters of a million dollars of taxpayer money to, it's like bringing a, a nuclear bomb to a night fight. I mean, it doesn't, it's not necessary. You know, it's no coincidence that a lot of their swales that are going in the Kimberly Horn design are going in right where our swales were that we put in 40 years ago. Because we didn't just walk and say, hey, put a swale here, put one there, put one there, put one there. No, it was designed by Charlie Crew and them there put in for a reason. And the reason why they wash out, because they don't, you know, the reason they wash out, now nobody's catching any water up, up basin. I don't understand this phase one and phase two also. If it's phase one, why is it at the bottom of the basin and phase two is at the top? You always catch water at the top first. Are they going to construct it that way? I mean, if I go to Ikea and get a, a kit that says phase one, phase two, you do phase one first, you do phase two second, right? It's just logic. What what if you're saying it's going to be constructed all at once, but where do they start? If they start at the bottom, the top is going to blow it out. That's what's happening right now. I think that that's the reason why there's a, a an undercut underneath that curve on the Avenue, uh, where Magnolia is. It you got a big swale that Charlie Chu designed 40 years ago that's never been utilized. All there is is a drain there. The water just gully washes right into it and washes out that corner and washes it on that. It's the same thing at uh, at Bessie Street um, with the Gulliver House has to deal with. Their old swales are up at uh, Seventh and uh, Bessie Street that aren't utilized that could be fixed. I'm glad you brought up that water because I've been opposed to this project from the beginning. Four years ago, Robert bent over backwards and John bent over backwards. They get the residents together during COVID. We had all those series of Zoom meetings. Exhausting, but probably at least half a dozen. And the only carrot that was offered that we that I that even changed my mind was the water. I said, okay, well, if I get orange kind of water, at least you know my my insurance will go, my homeowner's insurance will go down. I won't have to put another twenty thousand dollars well in. But that's gone now. It's just taken out, and then we didn't even find out about it until three weeks ago. It's not that the water's not going to happen. The water will happen as soon as it ain't going to happen in my lifetime. I can that's, tell you that. That's right. not. That's not so. I'm 71 years old. I'm never going to see that water. I think you will. Let me tell you something. Here's, here's Robert did a question and answer uh, video when we were doing those uh, the Zoom meetings. I think it was his title. It said it was titled "Say No to Grants, and Protect Our Roads, Etc." Right? I don't know what that means, but anyway. About three slides in, it says, how do we achieve the balance at the top? You can look it up. It's all on your uh, uh, computers or videos there. This is the arduous path the town staff has been directed to achieve. But as you will see, we have a plan. Establish a maintenance plan on what we have. Reestablish swell systems we have. That never happened. This is three years ago. Train public work staff on means and methods of maintaining not only dirt roads, but also stormwater systems. How many training sessions have we had in the last three years, Rob? I'm just curious, public staff. 
How much training? Have you had any training especially for uh, maybe players? No. You know my point. Yes, actually, we have an engineer. You spent three quarters of a million dollars when all you got to do is fix what's up there, and I don't get washed out anymore, and the road doesn't get washed out anymore. But for some reason, everybody refuses to touch those things. Tell you why. Yes. When you go and start messing around with non engineered solutions, they're engineered. They're engineered, and you said they were, they were left to decline. It's not. Just circumstance that the solution maybe is the same or similar because good engineering is good engineering. You guys said yourself the road has changed three feet at the bottom. So if the road yeah. has changed three feet because they keep pulling the dirt up from the bottom and putting it up at the top. What? I just I, I, I want to help. Okay. <laughs> All of this yeah. is the solution has to be done properly. Yeah. We've seen it. We've seen it work. We've seen it done at the other lake beds, the other drainage areas, the other basins. We tweaked on those. They work very, very well. This too will work very, very well. But this will work very, very, very well. That's, that's it's in writing. We said his writing reestablish existing soil. I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't think they have their thing. It's right. It's, it's, it's in the video. Why don't I just say one? And you didn't send it to me, so I don't have it. So, oh, it's my. When we, <laughs> when, well, listen, like you, we've been working on this yeah. for the last five years. Yeah. Like everybody. So yeah. A lot of times it is. It's designed to reduce the sediment that goes into the lake. Yeah. Most of the people here are very supportive of that. I make sure that we don't flood out those homes down there. The roadbed. We spent tons and tons of time trying to get to a solution that would allow us not to have to follow the FDOT Greenbook standards. And we were able to do that. We worked tirelessly to try to come up with ways that minimize the impacts on the town's land itself to better serve those residents that live there, which include you. Lake Bessie's just fine, by the way. I talk to Orange County Environmental about every two months when they put that Carolina stick and Lake Bessie and come out with testing. Lake Bessie is cleaner than any lake on the Butler chain of lakes. They tell me that every time they come out, there's no issue with us. Well, we're going to keep it that way. Listen, it's the same similar design as Charlie True did. I, I again wasn't here when that happened. It's it's based on the same. On for ten like it's out there cleaning out. Without the drops, you can't do it. So. Anyways, the last time you go and, and just engineer or, or not engineer and just do your, your drainage, that's when you end up with work. I promise you that. It yeah. costs a lot more than $700,000. Yeah. I promise you. Well, I don't like the project. I'm opposed to it. My neighbors are opposed to it. Everyone on 9th Avenue is opposed to it. When I sat up there in that tape, we sat down here, actually. We weren't up on the stage. I would never oppose a unanimous neighborhood on some project. I would never shove it down their throats if they were opposed to it. I would try to mitigate it in some way and help them out. I don't think this, I don't like it. The glances don't like it. Dennis Scroggins doesn't like it. Just, why don't you, you want to do a, a, a Shambu Lock survey who wants to answer? Why don't you do a survey with people like that's, that's the uh, drainage basin and ask them if they want this. Or if there's a better way to fix it. Then with a lot less money, I'll be here to hear from them if that's how they feel. I'll take that into consideration. I don't think they're taking the survey in a flood in town. We know that. I appreciate what y'all do out there. I'm just that way. It's no fun. I did it for 10 years. I understand it. But I'm just telling you what I feel about it. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Nancy. Uh, Nancy Barno, 225 East 9th Avenue. Um, I would just like to add that um, we depend on the website for information. And when we left the meeting October 22nd, which is inaccurate in today's agenda, reads the meeting was on October 26th. Um, we, what was listed under projects and studies under Bessie, um, did not include any plans for phase one, phase two, or um, water utilities. 
So we left the meeting tabled on October 22nd. We said we'd never seen these phase one and phase two plans. And then um, lo and behold, October 31st, three links were added to the website. That was the first that we had seen phase one and phase two. And when you click on the water utility, it takes you to Butler Street. It has nothing to do with Bessie. So I think the information has been inaccurate. Um, you all know how long we worked on this since November of 2018. Something happened between the last 90% meeting in, um, I think it was December of 2021, and then the split happened in 23, but we never saw the plans. They were never posted on the website. So I think there's, there's been a lack of communication, transparency, and I know the people in here know how important this is to us, and I just don't think that we received the information that we need. And then I'd also like to say, um, having spent hours in the last week reviewing all of the watch videos, um, every time water was mentioned, the water utility was mentioned. There's going to be three feet here, there's going to be three feet here, we're going to have water run down here, it's gone. So at the October 22nd um, meeting, John Fitzgibbon said to me and my neighbor, not having the water in the plan is the first I've heard of it, correct? Well, I think what I said was come to the microphone, John. See, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's an important conversation because the decision was made by the town based on funding. And yes, it's a new revelation, right? This is where we are. October one is a new fiscal year. And so well, we're like Robert said tonight, doing it. And, and, you know, I stand up here tonight as both a resident, but also as somebody who met with you guys hundreds and hundreds of times. And you guys have walked alongside me and understood the plans and understood what we're doing. And in 2008, when we built the Water Bessie project, it saved plumes going out into the lake. And so the stormwater project we did back in 2008, which had huge plumes going out of the lake, is actually what saved the lake. So this town is investing in opportunities to continue to save our lakes. And as I walk alongside you guys on a day-to-day -day basis, as both a neighbor and an engineer representative of this town, Bill, I had a meeting with you the other day. We totally got what we were doing. And then I stand here tonight and hear what you said. It's not that I totally got what you were doing. I don't just, I've got, if I ask you, if I ask, I, I still want, let me, let me answer that question. I said, you never answer on every question I ask. Well, I, I would just disagree. I would disagree with that to some extent, but I'm not going to stand here tonight and argue. What I am going to stand here tonight is ask the town council to say, we had a hard decision. Got a few residents, maybe not want to do the project. The hard decision will make you. So, what I've asked the residents when they address the council on this side of this are they happy with how it is now? Because that's what it will be like if we don't approve the project. They will never be better. No, it's but probably we feel it works. Like we, Scott Brown. I, guess I can tell you that we feel here. that said. since November of 2018. Nothing has been done to help our erosion situation because we've got this coming down the pipe. Right. Nothing has happened. That's, that's not true. I can speak so, for a minute. Thank you, pardon? I would say I can speak for a minute, yes, you do address what she's saying. So I've been here since pre-Scott Brown, and um, and I'm just going to be honest about what I've witnessed. So when I moved here. The, the properties that were across the street from me were built. Two new houses directly across from me. They were constructed in 2018 and 2019, finished 2019 and 2020 by the time they both got their certificate of occupancy and moving. At the time those projects were built, there was a right of way use agreement for their driveway aprons as well as the swales in the city's right of way. 
That was under Scott Kirby, uh, Scott Brown Kirby. He was here at the time that was done. When all of this stuff came out about the Bessie project, and it was discussed, what are we going to do with these roads? What are we going to do with these whales? The Fort Tiny was brought on board. Those had a shape and a grade, and they were part of a right way use agreement that this town approved. Now, if you go out and you look at those whales across the beach today, that were both approved post 2018. The one in directly in front of the closest to the corner is completely filled in and it is level with the road. Whereas that thing used to be a hill that was 45 feet deep, went down the slope across, and back up the other side. My daughter used to roll down it because she thought it was, you know, a hill in Florida. Now, over the past four years, since they started that project and these swales were done, at the time that they were constructed, um, and I know this was pre tanya but when those swales were constructed, the day they came out and graded the soil before they laid the salt was a Friday afternoon. We had a thunderstorm on the weekend that completely destroyed the shape of that. I pointed it out to Brad Cornelius at the time, who explained to me that this purview was over the property itself. And that the right of ways fell under the purview of Scott Brown because they were in fact in the right of way and they did in fact have a right of way use of it. Nothing was done about it. They were not required to fix those swales, even though they had a right of way use agreement. I don't know if it was the town's responsibility or if it was the homeowner's responsibility to fix it. At the time of construction, Scott Brown passed it. So I get that. But elevation surveys were required for them to have the right of way use agreement for that swale. Between the time that those swales weren't functioning until now, Tom Fry, our neighbor who lives the south, who owns the property that's having part of the flooding that this project is being built to help them as well as all the other residents, came out several times. I witnessed him, my husband witnessed him, my husband's here as well tonight, and watched that man dig a cutout from the road into that soil to make it function because it wasn't functioning and it was not maintained since. 2019 or 2020, depending on which one you're talking about. So you're talking four years that the town should have been maintaining those swells, and they haven't been. And I know most recently, our own council member, Mr. Screw, came out one time and dug out that to help the water get off the road and into those swells that have not been maintained for four years that are in fact in the town's right of way. And if you go down to Bessie Park, to the area that's going to become the retention pond, the one I call globally, whatever you want to call it, which Triangle one at the uh, north part of that park. At the bottom of it, there are two sewer grates. When I moved here, you could walk down onto the one sewer grate and you could walk on level land to the other sewer grate. And they were like, I don't know, seven feet deep from the grade of the road. And if you go down there now and you look at it, and I know some of you probably now there because I know you can be with residents, that thing has filled in more than five feet deep with seven. It is not maintained. And the front square sewer, Tom's there, I forgot there was a second sewer until I was walking there today. In the front sewer, it has sedimented up so much around it that they go out and they dig a rectangle. And when you walk down to that pit, you walk down now about three feet, and then there's this square of sand that keeps getting dug out, dug out with like shelf holes on all three sides that are like three, four feet deep. So I, as a homeowner, I think not against this project. Okay? Um, I'm still somewhat against it because in theory, yes, if it collects all the sediment elsewhere before it gets to that point, that would be great. But what I have seen over the past eight years that I'm now here coming about a month, I'll be here eight years, is all of these soils fill in and fill in and fill in and fill in and fill in. And they're not being maintained. So my concern as a resident is that we're going to build all these things in everybody's yards and adjacent to their yards, because I understand it's quote unquote the right of way, but we are required to maintain it, we're required to know it, and if we don't, then we can get cited for, because there's an ordinance that says we have to maintain that property next to us. If that grass gets too tall, I don't know it, I can get in trouble for it. I can get cold by it. I've already been through this the first year I lived here when one of the properties near me was being constructed. So those they are not being maintained. 
I also know that I came to this town, my non council was November. In January of this year, as I made on assignment, I went to a Butler Chain of Lakes Advisory Board meeting from the county. And that was the first that I had heard that second avenue, which was, I think, Mike Millar that presented at that county meeting. That second avenue came back with such a high benefit cost ratio, it was a problem. And I'm like, wow, I think they, they've got higher value properties there. So I know their beauty star is going to be better than ours. And I came to the meeting and I, and I talked with Robert and I said, what's going to happen with Bessie and Butler? We don't have the value of properties that they do on Second Avenue. Are these projects going to get washed? Are we going to get the BCRs that we need? And then we started talking about the split for the project. And everybody's saying that this project was split. And I spoke with a couple of people today, and I did go back to figure out there was an IPO that came before us as council in April that talked about the project split. I do think there's a severe concern with transparency, though, because when you go back and you look at these drawings, and how Chow already spoke to this this evening. Some of these are dated March of 2023. Some of these are dated May of 2023. I live in, in the neighborhood that it's happening. It affects every one of us. And then evidently these drawings for the split came up two years ago. So why was the first that I'm even hearing of this? In the April meeting that came on the agenda or discussions with Robert after speaking with hearing this of the, uh, the proposal that was, or Dalton Ponies, or whatever you want to call it, that was given to give the, the county, sorry, Mike Pilar's presentation to the Orange County Butler Chain of Lakes Advisory Board meeting about the problems with the PCR and what was going to happen to the Butler and Bessie projects. They were going to have to split this project. Because clearly the decision to split the project was made over a year and a half ago, and nobody knew. None of the residents that are impacted him, so it wasn't transparent. And I'm sorry, but while we're doing this, if you split it into five parts and do it at the same time, and it's the same project, what I don't understand that. At the October 22nd meeting last month, I asked the projects would be constructed together at the same time. The response that I got from Robert, and I'm not going to quote it verbatim, but I can if I go back and look, was that he wasn't sure he would check with Tony and get those answers to it by the next council meeting. And I've not heard anything that of information being provided from that point on. Um, and I did get an email from Robert because I said, you know, these, at the meeting last month, I said, these drawings are not on them. There's no final plan. I can't see the 100% drawings. And at the council meeting, during the council meeting last month, there was emails that went back and forth where Robert was asking how child, did we have the latest ones on the website? And Tanya wrote back and said she thought so. And then around eight o'clock the night of the meeting, um, it was said that no, they're not the current ones. The current ones were not on the website. They were not a part of our agenda packet last month. So nobody can review this. We're not even staying in sunshine laws and this information isn't being provided. So I get an email on October 30th that says my mistake, which I appreciate acknowledging the mistake, and that the, the drawings would be added to best, that, that it would be added to the Bessie project study page. And they were on the 31st. That's a full week past our council meeting. Now, everybody likes to say I bring things up at the last minute or something. On October 31st, I sent an email to Robert, and I said, please, the hyperlink say phase one and phase two, but it's not clear when these were um, phase plans were done. So please add a date to them. And by the way, what Nancy just spoke to, the Bessie Water Main Plans project that says it's an assigned project, when you click on it, it opens to the bubble project. So I pointed that out on October 31st and said, can we please have this corrected? Because residents are trying to find the information and they're not able to find it. I asked questions in that email about, did you figure out which council meeting the project split was discussed? I know you said some info, you would have to get from Dorothy when you return. Sorry, I don't remember if it was this too. I did not get a reply to the October 31st email that I sent to Robert. So Friday this past week, I sent another email and I was trying to get clarification on all these things because I'm meeting with the residents because they are the ones who look next to me. And I know they've reached out to 50 council members to meet with them. So I sent an additional email on Friday. Mind you, it was two o'clock in the afternoon because I would like to add that lately, agendas are not being posted seven days in advance of the meeting. This week or this month, the agenda was not posted until Wednesday night, which is six days. So as far as I'm 
to wear her for in violation of sunshine laws. Okay, well, okay, we'll see them on Fridays. Okay, well, either way, this is a big project. I've been asking for information since last month's meeting. I've been asking for information in an email dated October 31st. So I sent another email on Friday with a list of questions about when are they being constructed? Are they being constructed together? Because I asked that at last month's meeting, and I still didn't have an answer as of this past Friday. So I get the answer today at 12 14 p.m. And Tanya did provide the answers. It was confusing because when you look at the agenda, it did say, uh, and I understand now the phase two, phase one, and you know that this is what FEMA calls it for their construction and design, and I get that now. But I did not know that coming into this meeting, nor did any of the residents, nor has anybody had time to process this information. I mean, we need to do better with the transparency. Actually, a few years ago when this all started, I Thought we the town staff did a fantastic job. Robert did the walkthroughs, we did the videos, everybody knew what was happening along the project. He had the public workshop meetings, everything was very clear. It, it was honestly fantastic. But if this project all changed to a split project a year ago, whether it's because of funding or whatever the reason, none of it was com communicated to the residents. And as far as the water money, this was in the agenda pack, and I wouldn't have to ask you guys to look it up for yourself because yes, I know it wasn't part of the agenda packet. The blue line represents the bottom water. When we had a last 90% drawing, when this was presented as 90% drawing, the first words out of Robert's mouth for the first four minutes of that meeting is that for every project we move forward, we're going to do the bottom water if we're going to store water projects. I understand funding has changed. I understand inflation has happened. But the reality is when a resident sees that line drawn across the page and it says potable water, and how Chow actually spoke to that that night, saying that we were waiting on public um, utilities stuff from Orange County Utilities, and the permits were underway and moving forward already with uh, South Florida Water Management District. It was also discussed that this was going through the process, and if everything went according to plan, it would be going out to bid in spring of the next year around March. So it's perfectly understandable to think that the residents would believe that the potable water was part of the project. How would they not know? Nothing ever came down the pipe to let anybody know who wasn't a part of it. I know one of my neighbors received an email that said we already approved moving forward on this project on October 15th, which was not true. I'm a staff member. So, we need, to, we need to do better. I mean, th these are all valid questions that the residents have. And if we're not transparent having this information on the website, if we're not transparent, you know, coming forward with information, what I asked at last council meeting, two emails that went unanswered, how do you expect the residents to know what's going on and feel confident that the council is being transparent and wh where the confusion is? So, I, you know, I, I have to stand by my residence with all the confusion and concerns about transparency. It is an issue. I, I just like to finish by saying oh, that see. we've lived here in town since 1975. We love our little piece of heaven. We love the representatives that we elect. We appreciate John. Um, and we would just like whatever happens, we'll survive it. But I don't feel this has been an open process, especially since when we walked away from the 90% plans in January of 2021, it is not what we see in phase one and phase two today. Finally, I'd like to ask, when does this money have to be spent? When will these funds run out? And then knowing that with the changes that will probably happen, um, FEMA is going to be changing their um, output so that it won't be 75 25 anymore. It'll be 25 75. So, can you answer those questions? I, I will tell you this the Stafford Act is the Stafford Act until it is not, um, which that addresses the, the, the match. I can't tell you the exact uh, what's our funding deadline. When do we have to have it finished? How on the grant? This is the grant. 
I guess my other question is, is size the water is fundamentally different about the final executed project that differs from the problem. Size the water. I don't I don't know that there is any fundamental difference in the storm drain project. I'm not saying that there is. But, but I'm saying I'm that fine. no, I'm saying no, I'm not. Don't, don't put words in my mouth, Jim. Uh, so I'm saying that the main concern, the first concern that came up with everyone was that the potable water was dropped from the project. Sure. It is, it is absolutely is it. understandable that the residents were under the impression with everything that was happening. This is what was voted on. This was in the agenda pack. It wasn't potable water, but this no was approved in 2018. No right. So what I'm asking you is as in terms of the stormwater portion of the main emphasis of the project, what were the storm? What is what is fundamentally different? The fundamental difference in the design is none. The fundamental difference in the cost that's involved to pay for it has changed, not just because of inflation, but because when this project originally went through, the council approved it and was all for it. At that time, everyone was under the impression it was a 75-25 cost share. So in my eyes, regardless of what my neighbors say, the potable water dropped from the project. I thought the same thing, and I'm well versed on the project, but I also thought the water, water was part of it, and that it was dropped based on what was said at meetings and based on what went through and what was included on the plans that were approved by our council at the time. So that's the water portion. The cost portion changed, and it is more cost to the taxpayer dollars. <laughs> and regardless of my opinion, if you ask my neighbors, would you rather them spend $800,000 on potable water or $800,000 on drainage? You'll probably get two different answers. I don't think everybody's in agreement on that. But half of the issues tonight and, and the questions that everybody had could have gone a lot smoother if answers were provided. If the drawings, I don't I don't even know why we had a council meeting last meeting with an agenda pack that didn't include the plans of what we were approving to spend, you know, almost a million dollars on, but we need to be more transparent with the residents. So my points tonight are squish the bioretention spells. In the grand scheme of things, I don't have a problem with the project as it's been worked out, other than that I think that the drainage issues should be treated at the point of the source, which is in the upper basin, which is not where we're at. We're basically conveying all that water from Oakdale Street, shifting it down to the lake and treating it there from a biological standpoint. I've always said it would be better to have swales along Oakdale catching that water before it ever gets done. But in terms of, you know, I have serious concerns and I've always had serious concerns about how these are going to be maintained. Because I, if sediment does get in there, what I've witnessed is, you know, properties not being maintained. So if we build a project that doesn't have regular maintenance, then we just waste the taxpayer dollars. So I would really hope that there's a better maintenance plan. And in fact, then what's going on with the right way use agreements and other things that have existed for a long time that aren't being maintained. Um, James Lane. You asked for the date. Oh, yes. So in the phase two agreement, there should be a period of performance date, which is the date where you have to complete the construction of the project and close out with FPM. I don't remember the exact month, but I believe it was around mid 2026 for completion. What's the length of the build? Estimated that? Uh, we estimate that 12 to 18 months. Um, Jane Lance, sorry, I don't know. I'm going to pass. You're good. Can I ask a couple more questions, please? I'd like to defer my time. We don't have to defer that to the bill. Please come up and ask your questions. Besides the obvious contradiction. Come to the microphone so we can get you on the record, sir. Besides the obvious contradiction of what you're telling me about doing existing swales, what Robert put on that video saying we're going to free. All I said was I don't know what the past is. Well, I, I, no, no, no. can I come forward? No, no. It's on your tree. All you, 
The video is entitled Say No to the Grants and Protect Our Roads Question and Answer. It's on the list of videos on your screen. You click on it, you'll get to a page where it says where Robert basically makes my argument that reestablished swell systems we have, maintain, uh, establish a maintenance plan on what we have. So who's right? You, are you right that we can't do it? Or is he right that we can't do it? He's the town manager. I assume he's right. He's just made the art map and make it for 20 years. All I, all I said was, if you don't engineer your solutions and they're not, okay, uh, hang on, if they're not at the levels that they were engineered to be at, and you don't have the drawings and all that you need to do that, it's not an engineered solution. They may have been an engineered solution. If there's an engineer here that will tell me that I'm wrong. This program is after they're concerned. I'm telling you that I have a town manager telling me that they can reestablish as well as we have. Now, I have another question about phase one, phase two. Yes, sir. Why is the FEMA money in the phase two when the most, or why is the FEMA money in the phase two? No, the phase one, right? <laughs> I, I, can't, I, I can't get into it. Who knows what one, one two? Because what, the money is okay, one. you got to attach the water at the top of the basin. That's the most important part of the project, right? But that's the part of the project that's not funded by FEMA. So if you guys run out of money and you only do the bottom part of the project where I'm at, because that's where the FEMA dollars are. Let's, let's be clear. No, yes. one has, no one has indicated that we're going to do the bottom of the project. But, but that's where the FEMA money is. That, because that's where the BCA was. So you do it where you have the BCA, you get the most money you can, you do your match, because okay. you're, you're you're getting a dollar for a quarter. So are you saying you won't get a better bet for a taxpayer than that, then we'll take care of the upstream portion. We've allocated the funding to do that yes. as a priority and to even do it at the same time. I mean, yeah, I, really have, I mean, I understand what your concerns are. Yes. But I feel like we're, you know, the, the team has done a, a really decent job of addressing those concerns so you're getting everything that you need at the same time. It'll work. You're not, you're not answering my question. Why well, don't know what your question is. The water is, you have to catch the water at the top of the basin. The top of the we basin done. project is phase two. Is it um, done with phase two? Let me, let me help. Yeah. Help me out. Yeah. Kind of what we're talking. Okay. Phase two and phase one are really funding Correct. Right. Well, for, for the yeah. final portion, but we also are naming I understand. Projects. The intent is to bid the whole project at one, one time, director, and we'll look at the fungibility of money through the phasing so it allows us to set up a proper billing procedure for reimbursement. The contractor that does the project in totality, purple and green, will determine the best places to start and work his project out. At the end of the day, the intent for the town, and correct me if I'm wrong, is to build everything all at once. Because my system saying. functions as one entity. So please, Bill, don't get caught up on the term phase one, phase two. That's a Can I ask you a question then? Sure. Then when the project that was done on 8th Street and Vesta Street, when that project was done, why wasn't the upper basin addressed? Because that's why it's failing right now. Yeah, so what ended up happening in that project is we had funding, we did the project, we had extra funding, they said what do you want to do with it, and then we did another phase. This is a, a completely different. I, I, I know, but that project. The top of the basin was never addressed okay. in that project. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. It's independent. All right, Council. If you have any questions, please yeah. promotion to approve. Yeah. Yeah. We have a resident that's here that I know he's going to be here for the next one. Quick question is not controversial. Sure. Can you come up and write the name and your address? Yeah, I'm you want duck. Yeah, but the objectives are uh, three two seven eight eight. Another corner of best scene. Um, just curious to know when this project is undertaken. What will happen to my ability to get my house? It's it again for me. Sorry, I, I, I'm just concerned that once they start construction on that corner, I will have no way to get to my house. And so, are they considering? Yeah, let's let John address that because I honestly, you know, Bill. 
That, that's a good question because there's always some bad things coming up during the logistics of when the project actually does get done. Um, what we do is we'll work with you, and you have a long enough driveway and a, 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 a fair enough corner. Typically, we'll work that directly with the individual residents during construction for open ditch. And what we'll do is usually just do five sections at a time. So then we're never by open ditch. We always do it section by section to allow continued access to residents. Right. I'll also say that one of the great things about being in a town like this is that you have access to all these things. So if you run into anything, you better than someone. Yeah. All right, John, any additional questions? Can we take a couple comments? Yes, sir. Yeah. Real quick. That one of my, you know, my corner over here, they've got part of one of the next projects, and I had the same, same question, the exact same question. I called Hal, I met with Hal on my corner, and we discussed it. And he answered all the questions that I had prior, prior to meet with him. Some things I didn't know, some things I assumed, he clarified, and I was perfectly happy at that. Um, I talked to Tony personally, I talked to Travis personally. Spelled all I had the same exact concerns you guys have, and all those questions that I had, I asked them directly, and they gave me satisfactory answers. As a matter of fact, they modified a couple of things just to make me happy. So I would say that, and I don't whether we spend the money or don't spend the money, that's a whole different question. I'm asking that's not the correct question. Do we need to fix a problem? That, that's the real problem. It's like if we Money, yeah, I like all the money for, for free. I don't like doing projects just to get grant money. I'll be the first to say that. But I will say if there's something we can fix and we can't fix it, I just like to have these face to face. How is that me at my house? Robert that me on the street by the front of my house. Hines are at my house several times playing football in the streets. Travis asked him to take a dish out and they dig a swell. He dig the swell out for me. So I think a lot of this is just communication. It sounds like most of these questions could be answered in a different venue. Um, I've never had a problem with anybody answering my calls and meeting me in the street and talking things out, making some changes. The question I have is, is there a problem and will this fix it? That's the question I have. Um, and I don't know the answer to that because I don't know that corner. I do think that like Bill said, if you talk to the people, I did, I did dig out that ditch over there one day, because yes. it's just me, I walk around through Shady, cut down by, and I think I have bitches. But it's because I just saw a little puddle in the street, and I saw it where it could drink. This is me to fix the problem. I think I did in my house, too, for the same reason. But I do believe in asking the residents how they've watched that water come down the road for the last 60 years, and the best way they think to be mitigated based on them probably having to show them at some point in your life by doing something out front of your house. Been to great water, so I would just say that it sounds like the project is necessary, and I think a lot of this stuff can be answered with phone calls to people and a face to face conversation. That's been my experience, and it's worked out pretty well. I also let me forget we we seek grant funds to leverage taxpayer dollars to do things that we're not able to do under the tax. Second Avenue is a great example. This project is a great example. There have been many others. The, the, the state school trail is a great example of that. You don't see grant funds just to see grant funds because obviously it's not always fun. Um, but what we try to do is to smart and take advantage of opportunities that we have to leverage those funds and to provide better and safer services for the town. So I, I just want to be clear because I know there's always a little hesitation with grant funds in the community, and I understand that because anytime you accept money, it always, it always rules you. No one just gives you money to spend it as you like, um, only to ask. You know. uh, but, but, but nobody else. There's always, uh, there's always restrictions. So it's just part of the game, and we have to look at those things and decide whether it's something that makes sense for the town. All right, Kelsey. Appreciate everybody's uh, efforts. I would, I would just say, I would take serious notice of what the people live on that street say. It's affecting them the most, and I think they have, I think they have some intelligent influence. But I think on this process, I know John does this, John talks about all the projects. I know you can do some, you know, 
lifetime change to be happy, happy. So that just might be to talk to people who live there. And Mayor, before we vote, it's one of the things that I do think that we need to address what Bill spoke out to is you know, Tanya, we probably need to look at the level of maintenance we have and the investment we're making in the maintenance system. We have been doing a lot of these drainage projects. I know you've got the uh, back truck coming out to a maintenance. You, you've leaned into that quite a bit, but are enough resources being put against that. Um, you know, so we need to evaluate that. The second thing, Mayor, um, has to do with all the water versus these two stormwater um, projects. In the project meeting, of which I'm the liaison, there's been three discussions. One is the SC project, one is the Butler project, one is the the water. At no time have any of those been convoluted other than the potential construction phasing um, as discussed in some of the workshops. So I just want to clarify that. Fair enough. Uh, going forward. There is some confusion on this project, Robert. Um, John, you may want to you know, take another walk with the 100% with plan set, just make sure everybody understands what's going in. Um, just so everybody's got the understanding. It's, it's clear to me, uh, obviously, and I walked with Bill on, on Saturday, uh, you know, to look at the plan set and talk through it. I, I thought I explained all of it, but I guess I'm, I'm not I'm articulate enough to, to get that past, but this is a couple of points. Uh, you know, I want to say one more thing. I do appreciate that, you know, some of the council members went out and met with them. And I think that's great. I think the concern for me was is that, you know, three of the different members uh, from the community came from that project area last month to ask questions. We, we didn't get the answers then. It could have been resolved with simple either miniature public workshop for those residents to go over all the questions and everything that had come up, or you know, answers right after the meetings and the things people were asking so that we weren't, people were really, really stressed out the last couple of days coming up to here. I know they met with a couple of council members, myself included, a few times. Um, and then I know John was out to people's houses and, you know, there was confusion about the six inches and whatever. I think it's great that council went out, but I still think that it should have been, you know, been controlled more by staff and, either a workshop to answer the questions all at once for everybody. And then if they wanted to meet with people afterwards, then, then fine, we'll have, you know, meet with people. But if those clarifications and half of what how Chow presented tonight would have been explained two, three weeks ago, we would be in a much better state of people not being stressed. And I mean, there's people that couldn't even make it to the meeting tonight that are all worried about what's going to happen. And I just don't feel that our residents should have to worry about that. So that's the only other thing I wanted to say. Any additional comments, questions, or concerns, Council? See then, then for a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Person Lane, second. Second, Council Person Davitt. Any additional comments, questions, or concerns? Anybody? Council Person Street. Aye. 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 Nay, but because I've never, I've always thought we should control them the north end of the project. So that's from Dave. Motion. Uh, is approved. Four to one. Council person means to send you. Next up, the financial. I approve Lobs drainage and Lexi pave for Centennial Walkway at Central Park, Parks and Recreation. Um, are we going to present a little bit tiny? All right. Yeah. The Parks and Recreation Committee has been working for some time to contribute projects to the Centennial celebration. And tonight we have two of their items on the agenda this evening. Um, they have wanted to redo the, the walkway at Central Park. It's currently asphalt, but if you've ever been out there, it's, it's not a very safe path anymore for people to run and walk on. So they had always been talking about the idea of looking at some kind of board in place product, something like that. So the tree board members actually went to a tree conference and came back with a new product called Lexi Pave, which allows the water to trickle through. Um, and it's a, a good product, something that's environmentally friendly and something that will stand up better for the walking and the running that the track was intended for. As part of that process and talking about what we could do for the Centennial Committee, we thought it'd be a wonderful idea to actually create it as a Centennial walkway. Um, and the Flexi Pave contractor was able to figure out a way to actually make a medallion of the Centennial logo and be able to embed that in the walkway so that forever it will be the Centennial walkway. 
So I'm bringing it here this evening because it does exceed the threshold for the town manager to approve. It comes to the level of town council. It is a sole source because FlexiPave is a sole source product and the only um, vendor that can install it here in our area is Lobs Drainage and FlexiPave. So we are asking you to go ahead and approve that because we are wanting to ensure that we get all these things done in time for the centennial celebration and get these things underway. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Yeah, it's recycled. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should have brought that PCI. I know I should have, shouldn't I? I could have passed it around. It's on my desk. <laughs> Yes, yes, they do. And I will be sure to get you that information on what that warranty is. Um, we also looked at another board in place product, which was more than $10,000 more than this product. And that did not include a customized logo in it. This is for the burner track around. Yes, park. yes. Be good. Yes, and the committee has committee has quite a bit of the money towards it, and then the Centennial Committee has been so gracious with their funding to help with these projects. Council, any additional questions? For a motion to approve. Council first, please. Second. Second. Council first. In voting, Council first, please. Aye. 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 Next up is approved representative services purchase for Memorial Bench Program. This is also for our centennial celebration. It's the Piggyback School District, Piggyback Country School District, and it's in Yes, sir. Thank you. So the second item that the Parks and Rec Committee wanted to pursue for the centennial was what originally started as a memorial bench program, but they prefer the idea of a legacy bench program so that it might not just be a memorial, it might just be a legacy bench that somebody purchases for their family. So we're calling it the legacy bench program. We can piggyback the Manatee County contract. We can get those 12 benches. They've got a whole plan to promote where these locations will be. I've already got the concrete contractor coming out to give us the prices to force labs because what we have in the parks now is benches that were put on non-slabs and they're not holding up very well. So we want to make sure we'll have slabs with these. So they have a whole program in the committee to, to promote this. And the idea is that somebody will adopt a bench. So really the money that's being expended today will be recouped in that. Um, I only have one question because yeah. I have my legacy bench on flexi date. <laughs> 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 I'll have to look about. I'll have to look at keep that cost effective there. Sometimes I fall off the bench. Yeah. All right. Council, any questions for Tanya? Council person today, would you like to make a motion to approve? I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second, motion approved. Second, council person David in voting. Council person Stroop. Aye. 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 Thank you, council. Our mayor and liaison reports. Let's see, we've been busy. We had a great, uh, a great Veterans Day celebration. Uh, super, very nice. Uh, Councilperson and Dad did a great uh, presentation on veterans issues. Well, uh, well, now we got a car show. We got the judge's car show, and everybody left with a trophy. So uh, it's kind of like T-ball. Any additional? Uh, uh, um, uh, the the I'm pleased to announce that earlier this evening, the council officially approved the legacy bench program as part of our ongoing celebration of the town members. This initiative will allow members of our community to contribute to the Town Science by adopting benches that can be placed in key, key areas throughout our public space. Additionally, I bring a message from our Parks and Rights Committee. They wanted to inform the council of their goal to eventually replace some of the swings into our parks. These improvements reflect our ongoing commitment to create safe, welcoming, and well maintained recreational areas for our residents. In a special gesture of gratitude, the committee is looking at adopting the, the new swings in honor of two long serving retired members. Mark Rokey and Tracy Mitchell. 
Both Nora and Trinity have contributed so much to our community throughout their dedication and hard work. Honoring their legacy in this way feels like a, a fitting tribute to their enduring impact on our parks and our town as a whole. Thank you to the Parks and Rec Committee for their vision and commitment to make you when you're a wonderful Very nice. Thank you. Councilman Smith. Hello, Parks Mayor. So um, last Thursday, I attended the municipal advisory uh, for Metro Plan Orlando, uh, where they updated the FDOT uh, transportation infrastructure program. Obviously, uh, in fact, uh, not a year just yet, but working on it. And then uh, last week as well, uh, Monday, for Preservation Board, they're working on uh, their contribution to the Centennial Celebration. Uh, more to follow on that. There are a lot of land that's happening. Okay, that's the dates. Uh, the new fun stuff. So, December 6th, holiday of the month. About starts about five o'clock, and then the following Tuesday we have council also, but we will have uh, the elders luncheon at eleven thirty. Okay, Council Member Smith. Yes, Council Member Smith. Any additional uh, reports? Yeah, you should have been uh, already. Yeah. Uh, the tree board, uh, they met last month. They talked about forming a subcommittee to start working on some changes to the ordinances and the state costs. Um, this is something we're planning to do a deep dive into the strategic plan to pick out which things are going to work on first. Um, Staff meeting for the school have been really happening there. I'll give them the most recent update that we you know I'm looking forward with the board trail on the bridge because we're all anxious to hear about that. And Butler Chain of Lakes advisory board meeting really just kind of discuss the uh, condition of the lakes and how long they think it's gonna take for them to go down and there's still probably gonna be a couple more months of you know restrictions on the programs being open. So Oh, and on that note, yeah. uh, we do have a fence that's broken down right now on Lake Bessie Park that people are using to put boats in that way because they don't need to do the thing. So if we can get those fence panels. Thanks. Those panels were just delivered Friday awesome. to my staff. We've been having difficulty sourcing those, but we did get the order on Friday. That's it for that. Is on. Jim, this is just in. Or if you keep this fact check this morning. Karen Fetty here says, I'm sorry, I can't meet it tonight. Do you or someone mention the fact that we had 81% plus voters in the last election to include mail in early and same day voting? Very great presentation. That is impressive. That's that's what you wanted. I didn't know that. Thanks a lot, Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. We appreciate all those who volunteered um, to run our record of the precinct. Yeah. yeah. And she also helped out. She got out the uh, survey. That's right. She, she, the she sat out there and um, All day. she <laughs> said 6 30 and they opened the door. They had 60 some people in line. Everyone filled it out. So she was putting it out there. I think they got. I just told today we got 200 or so, don't quote me, 200 or so unique uh, submissions from town residents. Five non like close, close, yeah. Was, we have 198 total responses to that survey. Five were outside addresses from the town, and um, we had um, a few we had disqualified because of the same thing you spoke. Um, <laughs> and of the 198 that we got. Um, 159 of them were from unique town addresses. That's outstanding. Uh, yeah. Yeah, really yeah. How long are you going to hold it open? He closed it on. He closed it on Monday at 7 a.m. We can open it back up again. I yeah, yeah, I think we got 250. I mean, we got 1,300 residents there about. 
I no, think we can at least get to the number out. You know, that 20, 30% number, let's get a little bit more input on there because the shreds that we have is great. Except we missed, we didn't have a single family member that was in their forties with kids there. True, and, and unfortunately, and we, I did not. Get some and then we got our area that. Most kids Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah. Making sure we Sorry. get the word out to. Um, I can please just go this month if, if it's extended for a little bit longer. Yeah, we can as well. We'll, we'll I mean, I'd, 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 I'd like to see it open yeah. so we get to like a 250. I mean, it's not that much further, but no, just looking at you know, we've got a population of cats to get to a certain percentage of it. And yeah, it's hard to see because I know the you know, you get the little group out there to pass that around to yeah. um, to town residents. Right. Is it forward. you're bringing it back? With the results and right right now, would you be able to still have that time if it was open to like Thanksgiving? Okay. Well, we're right right now we're scheduled to bring back the results of the survey and the charrette to you all at your workshop next week. Okay. Is what we are. Well, we, well we can I mean we could still do that with the information we have at that point. So the twenty oh we can't do that. But so yes, I by there I can. Okay, yeah. 20th, the one or 20th. Oh, he, no, it's the 20th. He, he's talking about the uh, the public outreach. Yeah. Not a, not a town council workshop, but it's a public outreach for the town hall improvements. That's yeah. So that on the 20th. November 20th. November 20th. So we yeah we're gonna be on that. So what we can do? We'll reopen it up. I can report out the results as of then. So we're putting that together. Oh, right now. I, I will say that's bring parents signing down. I think so we're gonna have a huge. Probably. Yeah. All, all we're doing with that is just reporting out what we got. We're not making recommendations. We're not making, we're just looking for direction from the council of what you all see is important from the feedback that we got. And, and as long as the appearance isn't that, we're keeping it open to get answers that we want. It's just trying to get more participation. Because I just know well, how conspiracy theories work. Oh, you know, <laughs> you know, I get no, it's like, well, like you can the answer you wanted, so you're keeping it open all the Yeah, so you close it. I don't care. I'm just, you know, I don't understand. The what meeting is the 20th is a town hall session. It's on the It goes from the way it's on the 19th, street board on the 21st. Yeah, that was open. The other one's Yeah, I have it on my calendar, and then also I believe Willie was supposed to post it today, if not tomorrow. That the agenda back it out. Six p.m. We'll open it up for another week. Just get some more input, but we'll still report out. Yeah, it's all. Thank you, sir. Start reports. Yes, sir. Again, November 20th, 6 p.m. We'll have the town hall public meeting. Uh, November 22nd, um, Council Member Dad and I had a meeting with uh, Rotary about the McCree invoices. The budget amendment report that we were trying to get scheduled for the workshop this month, we didn't have availability, so we're going to go ahead and push that to December. And that'll be the same time we talk about the golf cart IPO. We're currently monitoring another storm system in the Caribbean. Um, it's, all the models are kind of going in the same direction, which is very scary, but we're looking at possibly something with Tuesday or Wednesday, Mary? Next week. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So another thing is I was elected to the West Orange Chamber Board of Directors. I didn't even know that I was nominated, but I was informed that I was elected. So I guess the end. Wow. <laughs> Induction is going to be on um, December 5th. And then I'm currently going to be working on a meeting with the church to go with forced uh, access. And then again, we just talked about the stress survey. And I do want to state that, you know, a policy of mine that I've always pretty much hoped to stick to is never. Um, 
getting into combative discussions with members of the public when they say they're a priest, but I had no conversations that I'm aware of that would say you can remove the gate as private property. <laughs> that would not be the discussion I have. I I don't think we can do that. So you know, we'll we'll work it out and we'll work out in a fine way we can do it. We negotiate wealth. We have a lot of trust between the church and the town and the town and the church together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the only thing I want to make an announcement on is that my team's been working over here this week to get the cafe lights and all of the outlets ready for the holiday lighting. The holiday lighting company will be here this week to begin that process of putting the lights up. The only thing that I have is next Tuesday we're conducting training for Cuba's teaching work with genius. And their officer of training and low life on um, and for the council is always open to attend. It's next Tuesday, one to nine. So, whatever. You see, we don't normally say this real speech, but someone flips somebody up. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The officers that I talk to every day, I, is that possible? I mean, it would be a, a freedom of speech. I don't think that's mm -hmm. how we would uh, just address it. Right. It's definitely not a crime, but speeding sure. is definitely a crime. Uh, not the uh, the hand gesture would not be. Yeah. I'm doing that for more professional than that. And I think that we might be going to slice. No, he needs to be just crashed. Okay. She's like, I got it. I don't got it. <laughs> so, Sorry. I just want to remind everybody to follow my coming up December 10th through January 11th. I'm very confused. They'll be beating the door down. Oh, thank you. Yeah, one part of that. If anybody needs any help, let me know. Packets are ready. If the packets are ready, I'm on the line as well. And, and reminders, we do have to, to return the form to you before you get your petition to the ERA. Any questions? <laughs> Anything else for the good of the word? Dismissed? All right. We are adjourned at 851.